you. So in the spirit of being scientists, we're doing a couple of experiments here. One of the experiments is that it's not just the Chris Digdigian show. Finally. This was at Chris's request. He's been doing this gig since 2008, soloing it. Um, another experiment is, is this thing, where we're technologists, right? We use technology to move information around and to collaborate, and we can like, it was stunning watching the slides for this come together. We used um, a collaborative slide editing software, and I got to watch an, something as smart as these five people all working simultaneously on a document. And it wasn't any one personality, and, and the, the ideas fed off of each other. It was amazing. And so this is another thing in that spirit. Um, if you want to play, it is a, uh, a little software service where you log in, you don't have to use your real name, and you can propose questions. And even if you don't want to propose a question, you can vote on questions. And when things hit a laggy spot, I'll just go to the top of the list, and assuming it's not too profane, I'll read it, <laughs> and the group will re respond to it. Another experiment we have are these microphones. <coughs> and let me demonstrate how these get used. Angel, if we could. Yes. <laughs> totally harmless. And also, I've seen these in use where people will um, want to play, and it will draw people into the conversation, where you throw somebody the microphone, and th they'll want to play enough that they're willing to speak up. Who knows? You don't ask questions. You're getting eternity. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. If, if the room goes really dead, I'm just going to start throwing it at you. Um, <laughs> And like I say, all of these are experiments. We do experiments not because we're certain they're going to work, but because it is an interesting thing to do and we intend to learn things. But backing all the way up, uh, we have five members of BioTeam here today. Um, we're gonna go give or take 12 minute presentation, 10 minute talk for each of five people. We're gonna flex on the schedule, it'll be fine, right? Mm -hmm. We have actually less than one slide per minute, so we've fallen off that, that whole thing. <laughs> But it still feels like a really great, large amount of material we've got. I, I won't bother reading it to you. I'm excited about the fact that we have uh, sobriety, discipline, sobriety, right at the end of the conference. <laughs> you know. And at the end, I'm going to ask the uh, panel to put out one or two sentences, which are the summation and what people should walk away from this conference with this year, which I think is potentially what we kind of want. What are we going to go home and tell our bosses that we learned at the conference? <coughs> You know, what is the tweet? And I expect you to disagree. <laughs> so this is a picture from, I believe, 2002. Uh, on the right, you can see uh, Mr. Dag Digian. And from right to left, there's Dag and Stan and Bill, who is down here in the front row, and Michael Athenas. These are the four founders of Bioteam. And um, this particular company has been associated with this conference for its entire duration. And um, I dug back, I think Dag started doing the Trends from the Trenches in 2008, right? It was referred to as the, uh, inof the inofficial keynote until they made him the keynote. <laughs> I dug through this and, and found this thing where as of 2008, all of us had deployed something on EC2, which we now know as the cloud. <laughs> you know, so we're actually in the second decade of cloud technologies, that's pretty cool, you know. But there are these new people, and, and I thought, <laughs> I would, uh, just, just to play a little game with the personalities. <laughs> and it, it turns out it's not strictly one-to-one. -one. <laughs> you know, but the weirder thing for me. <laughs> and if your, mind, if your mind runs to numbers, then you start looking at the composition of the letters in these names, and there's other patterns in there. I don't want to go into them. <laughs> but there's a lot of A's and doubled A's and skipped A's and stuff, and I'm sure some sequencing person could make a bit of a, uh, an analysis of this, and that would be great. I do want, kind of want to avoid this. The short speeches disguised as questions, really seriously. I want to keep this very interactive and moving rather than be too grandstandy. And with that, I am going to sit down and stop grandstanding. <laughs> and we're going to bounce directly to, um, it, well, once again, it's pronounced Slido, Slido to Aaron, who's going to kick it off with some distinction between hype and reality. <laughs> Not going to it, Aaron. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I get to the distinction to go first, and I'll try to set the bar low for my colleagues. I think I can do a good job at that. Um, so yeah, let me see. 
Well, I can advise, advance this slide. That's a good start. So um, really what this talk is about is just some thoughts on, you know, hype technologies, um, some thoughts about, you know, technological realities in this day and age, and then just kind of other random thoughts in between. Um, we were just talking a minute ago. I made sure to make a lot of content in here questionable for you all so you can ask some questions. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of set the stage here saying that, um, you know, we're currently so oversaturated with communication distractions and context switching that we overshare, we don't have time to fact check, and these things really amplify hype. So really the main takeaway, you can, you know, turn your brain off if you need to do that from here on for me, um, is just focused execution is the ultimate dose of reality and hype antidote. And I think um, it's especially important for all of us to realize we probably have a lot of uh, leadership in here in terms of technologists and things like that. And, you know, it's just very important. Sometimes we can get so abstract and so hype ridden um, that it, we can lose focus. So, um, so first thing is to say, don't have a technology for a strategy. Um, it's my belief that uh, we can't experiment with every, and evaluate every new technology. Um, I kind of know this because it's bio team's job to try, right? That's, that's my job and I'm not very good at it, <laughs> um, but I try. And so, you know, really understand the scientific use case first. We've probably underscored this in a lot of our own talks and you've heard that a lot while you're here. Focus on your pain. Really even for next year coming to this conference, bring your pain. Um, don't come to just check out new technologies, bring your pain and spend some time to really quantify that pain. Um, we're talking about what efficiency gains you need. Um, you know, what are you looking for in terms of capacity changes? What are you looking in, in terms of uh, agility changes to your infrastructure and technology and how you apply it in the scientific research? Um, so then you gotta, you know, basically map that to a technological delta to provide the relief, right? And choose your medicine. And then lastly, Counterintuitively, this actually allows you to be more innovative and creative. A quick example is um, as virtualization was coming on the scene like a la 2005 or 6, um, if you just blindly applied that abstraction model, you go, okay, well, this is a good technology, let's apply it, and you kind of would have moved your legacy infrastructure into that. But where I was at the time, I was fortunate enough that we were going, huh, well, what, what is our pain, and then what does virtualization enable us to do? So then a full decade ago, we were essentially building a microservice-oriented architecture um, that really led to a lot of big wins. So you can often kind of leap a bit forward if you start with the pain and map the technology to it. Um, so I want to just, I thought I would have to lift everyone up. I don't know how motivated everyone is right now, but um, uh, tech crunch meme. Um, it, a lot of bio-IT uh, trends talks we talk about, it's a really risky time to be doing bio-IT. Um, so I feel really tethered to this thing. Um, so. It's an insanely awesome time. I could use that, could I? Uh, <laughs> couldn't I? Um, so it's an insane and insanely awesome time to be doing bio-IT because there is just so much transformation happening in IT and technology in general. Um, one could say, well, that's always true. I just feel it's especially poignant right now, even just given my career and experience. Um, and I'll get into a few reasons why, and the, and the ones I missed, these guys will cover. So quick note about cloud. Um, pay attention to Dag's thoughts on cloud sobriety and also, you know, uh, cloud wins and pluses. Um, this One thing to note for those who don't know me, I'm actually a, a lot a contrarian with a lot of technologies and I don't really like cloud, but these are realities. Is um, It's still true that it's not a cost play, it's a capability play. That's why most have adopted cl the cloud and been successful because in reality, most of us just don't have the engineering to produce the APIs and stabilize adopting new technologies uh, in a way on-prem that we can in the cloud. So this is true for pretty much everything except infrastructure as a service. Um, so that's why that regular expression is there. Um, you know, there's no drop-in replacement today, again, except maybe for IaaS. Um, we've tried. I think we're going to move on to other things, and maybe we'll get it right on-prem later. Um, we will go to the fog and then, and then finally get back to on-prem with the goodness that is in the cloud today. Um, so there's a lot of hype around multi-cloud and multi-org. Um, in 2017, we're really seeing a lot of that. Um, it's a good thing, we all need to get there. It's just, it's more hyped than uh, canned reality right now. Same for, um, since I've been at BioTeam, the whole idea of hybrid cloud with a really strong consistency model. Um, again, that's a great thing, but it doesn't really exist quite yet. Um, so, another topic I really like is um, converged infrastructure. Um, so, basically, uh, our view of converged infrastructure is a little different than um, 
than others in that we really think about it all the way from the laboratory to knowledge and everything in between. And so why is this an important concept uh, given how buzzworthy it's become? Um, because really unifying, integrating, and simplifying what we do um, allows us to make room for what's next. Things are getting more complicated, not easier, right? We all feel that and see that. And so you really need to abstract and distill in order to even have a chance to step forward into what's next. And converged infrastructure lets us to do that. Lets us do that. And um, it's also going to allow us, you know, to take more of the hardware practices we've come to to put in place and uh, allow them to become software, which allows them to be more malleable. So things like uh, network function virtualization and and other things. Let your mind wander there. Or talk to me after. I don't have much time. So. Hype, um, everyone has a converged offering, just like everyone had a cloud offering. A lot of these are actually a business partnerships masquerading as converged solutions, so that's what that acronym is. Um, and one thing to really be careful about, because in some ways the enterprise is ahead of us here, um, you know, taking legacy things and putting them together until you kind of wind up with a converged solution, especially if those were closed or commercial offerings, you can very easily sprinkle licensing to such a point that the in-app purchases are going to make converged offerings once you get up to the platform and service level uh, incredibly expensive. So um, just watch for that as far as the converged offerings coming from the enterprise side. Um, and really, the, the two needs we need around converged infrastructure that we really lack is specific solutions um, from a hardware and software uh, perspective that fit scientific and research use cases. Um, we just weren't the driver here. And, uh, and also, we should design these solutions to be driven by scientists and not operations staff. That would be transformative. Um, a word on big data. Uh, that's a big data in a dunk tank. Um, so I guess I'll put a period after that. So, um, so really, to me, big data has never been a thing. It's we're transitioning from the information age to the analytics age. Um, and this has been in play for a while now. And um, so. One of the things we've learned through you know, grabbing onto this hype was that, yeah, it was really just a transition to a new epoch. Um, and uh, what's good for you know, an insert you know, hyper, uh, hyperscale company there uh, is not necessarily going to solve our pain points. Um, and so a lot of folks, though, kind of bought into the hype and felt they were missing out um, and sadly you know, rushed to implement blindly, not considering the use case or application carefully enough, a la my second slide. And so, um, that just led to a lot of waste and churn. And so, but the reality is we do need new methods in the analytics age, and a lot of those that came about during the big data buzz will and are being used. And really those that do adapt and use those will win, and I do think it is as dire enough that those who don't, you know, really risk extinction um, in a general sense. So another word on the newest um, buzzworthy trend, right, in, in 2016 and 17, artificial intelligence. So just like, you know, all buzzworthy things, it's not really new. Um, but I think as a society, we've seen some limited and correct applications of AI, um, and those really generated a lot of hype because it was exciting. They were palpable for us. I know I love having the right people suggested to join my meeting on my mobile phone. Thank you, deep learning. Um, you know, those things are cool. Um, and then that kind of overcame the confirmation bias we've all had around AI. And so the, the you know, so then once the genie's out of the bottle, right, every, everyone is buying into the hype, you know, or fearing the hype that uh, AI is going to solve everything and steal our jobs. Um, the reality is automation's been stealing jobs forever. You can see my example. Um, the reality instead is that, you know, AI is going to help us focus better. It's going to help us distill information better because we've quickly reached a point where we absolutely cannot um, use even crowdsourcing to distill all the information we have and, and, and make it intelligible, infer meaning from it, and drive value. Uh, we really need um, to leverage AI to help us filter these things and be careful of neural network bias along the way. Um, so words on compute and storage hardware. Um, this is kind of just a smattering of things that are in my head. Um, I'm kind of conservative about hard disks. I mean, people have announced that SSDs were taking over forever. Companies have been, you know, their R&D is largely focused on uh, SSD and now 3D XPoint the last uh, two to five years. Um, you know, what we're finally seeing is actual um, fire and not just smoke in terms of, uh, you know, drive, uh, fac you know, manufacturing facilities shutting down and, um, and the economic curves looking, you know, like they're converging nearer term. So, you know, this is a here and not yet kind of situation, but Definitely do prepare for, you know, primary uh, media to shift away um, from hard disks in the next couple of years. Um, it's really do, um, oh, I don't have enough time. So 
Um, watch AMD in 2017. Um, look at things, not only their CPUs and PCI Express lane considerations, see later in the slide. Also, um, check out Rock M. It's a really interesting um, uh, idea for uh, shared virtual memory between uh, main memory and GPU memory. Um, so hype, you know, this is one thing that kind of breaks the premise of the talk. Um, we're still kind of beholden to folks, uh, you know, providing things for us in hardware. And, you know, when we have FPGAs, we're going to find problems to fit um, that solution. Um, so uh, in 2016 onwards, we're playing a PCI Express lane game. And uh, this is uh, largely a function of all of a sudden having a lot of faster storage. And NVMe over fabric is very much a real thing. Um, that's going to be coming more and more in the next couple of years. I think I'll just skip down to saying uh, there's not a lot of time to distill this slide right here, but what the takeaway is is that PCI Express switching and low latency Ethernet and IB on the LAN do have the latency to correctly present uh, not only solid state NAND but um, NVRAM like uh, 3DX point uh, properly over the network. So this is why we're going to migrate from compute clusters also having really data clusters and huge points of presence on the on the network fabric, and we can do that. Um, although, you know, trying to globally share main memory, which would be a lot greater, we're still not quite there yet. We have to do latency hiding tricks, and it's, it's not um, uh, perfect. So, um, software. You know what, I think a lot of people are gonna cover this. Adam Kraut's gonna cover a lot of this. Pay attention to the Lambda function and serverless stuff that he presents, and, uh, and then maybe refer back to these slides later. Um, as far as workforce tra uh, transformation, Osseo will have a lot of good um, words on this. Um, I'm going to kind of drive home. I'm going to maybe take a couple more seconds, but I just ran out of time. Um, Osseo is going to talk about this, but I'm going to drive home what Chris said that, uh, you know, really with DevOps, you just can't even, unless, you, unless you're practicing that, you can't even get invited to the party for, you know, where, we're, we, where we've evolved to. Um, and that, uh, Really, it's very hard to find people that have the right mix of web scale and research um, skills, uh, especially high performance computing. And, um, you know, we're doing, I'll just end with um, saying we're doing a really bad job at shaping user experience um, and presenting things that are usable for scientists and non technologists, and that would allow more people to be in the party. And uh, we shouldn't just be creating things for each other to consume and make life easier. So, as far as what this all means, I'm going to skip past my idea and. Uh, and to say focus and um, pay attention to the rest of these talks. Thank you, everybody. So, so what, what, we yeah, have I think we have time for questions. We have time for questions. I actually was, uh, I'm not actually texting here. I'm looking at to see the questions that were asked. Who's the person who asked if I could reach the back of the auditorium? <laughs> <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> I'm gonna need. I'm gonna need an assist. Keep going. Let's get it to the back. This is, All right. Yeah. This, this is <laughs> workflow automation and process. All right. <laughs> and if it comes to hand, you may ask a question. I guess the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions. Nice. <laughs> you will have it thrown at you. There, there's one in the back. Oh. I don't know if I can throw that back. There we go. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Hey there. So. Hello. In terms of cl the evolution of cloud demand, it seems like we went from cloud, cloud, cloud to, uh, well, now that doesn't seem to work for everybody's workflow. What are you seeing specifically? Um, what's your perspective on that? Um, so the question was cloud and, and work. Well, I don't want to turn it into a speech like the New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> Not working for every uh, use case. Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, it, it's, it seems like over the past five years, it was, we, we want to go to cloud, but we can't because of privacy, because of regulation. Then there were better technology solutions to better facilitate that. And now some of the market seems to be responding with, well, wait a minute, why am I waiting six days or six weeks for this workflow when I can just do it uh, more cost effectively on prem? And um, more to the point, when you run out of money, 
that you need to get another grant or you need to be on-prem. So um, what, what are you seeing in terms of that and what do you think the future holds in store for cloud working together with, um, with scientists, with bioinformaticians? No, good question. So I mean, I think that point that was made um, in the slide saying cloud is a capability play and not a cost play is still true, and that I agree with you in that sense that things can often be done more efficiently with your own infrastructure, especially if you have sustained workloads that are measurable. Um, again, people went to the cloud because it has API everything, because tons of engineers have proved things out that even if you have the hardware on-prem, you just can't fit the software to it to do it. And so um, I think what will happen over time is people will kind of put two and two together, and I think they are. Uh, pay attention to Chris Dagg with Cloud Sobriety that um, basically uh, workflows will start to be done um, you know, on-prem with the same level of software engineering and, and, and that we have in the public cloud now. And um, it's just gonna be a matter of time and I don't know that the public cloud providers will be the ones whose software stacks are used in that sense. Anyone else who has any comments here, please jump in. I would add in that I think you hit it on your first couple of slides where the, um, and, and I completely agree with this, that cloud is a pure technology play does not actually address any particular business need or any particular scientific need. You know, if you focus instead on the actual business or scientific pain point, mm -hmm. we're starting to see some really remarkable transformations where whole categories of former, you know, whole, whole former categories of work simply move for, to different organizations. You know, you're starting to see different workflows enabled because of cloud, but yeah, the just like legacy lift to a hosted environment has not been as successful as it could be. Amen. So we have another one from online, which is um, thoughts on serverless architectures. And they use the acronym FAAS. So something as a service. What's F? Um, Function? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kraut. Um, so yeah, pay attention to Adam Kraut. He knows this <laughs> stuff, see? Um, serverless is absolutely where things are gonna go. Uh, I didn't get to talk about it much, but you know, we have to simplify, and not just like converged infrastructure, uh, we really need to start thinking about a multi-cloud internet scale orchestration framework governing how we do our workflows and workloads. And to do that, um, we really have been continually shedding legacy cruft, and even a multi-user, uh, a multitasking operating system is, is on the chopping block. So uh, I think the success of things like AWS, uh, uh, their Lambda service, and other things are starting to really um, prove that point. I think we're only going to see more of that. But please, anyone else jump in? Yeah, I would just say I think serverless is, yeah. I think serverless is kind of just a byproduct of, of hyper-converged infrastructure, right? So it's just a new capability when you kind of put all this infrastructure together that you can now run code you know, directly on the same platform as the storage. I think it's also interesting to look at some of the storage vendors and how they're enabling things like Lambda in their storage appliances. That's gonna get really interesting too. So it's not just gonna be Lambda in the cloud, it's gonna be doing Lambda-like things on-prem and you know maybe events flowing between both systems. So I think uh, I definitely think it's here to stay and it's just a byproduct of how we've been developing infrastructure. In storage processing. Yep. All right, so that was one person. I'm gonna ask that we move on to uh, the next one, Asya. And um, similarly, Let's just um, continue the conversation here. I'm excited about the fact that the back of the auditorium is participating. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so my talk is titled Data Transfer uh, and How to Deal with Millennials. <laughs> I'll explain. Um, data transfer because I'm bored with data management. Um, and uh, how to deal with millennials is basically to get you in the room. And I think it worked. <laughs> Do I advance slides here on the laptop? Just the arrow down. Okay. So I like this to be uh, an exchange of information, not just us talking at you. Um, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you feel like participating, just raise your hand. Who here has big data or something like it, or somebody who thinks that they have big data? Okay, about a third of the audience. Um, how big is it? Raise your hand if you think it's big. <laughs> <laughs> a lot less, okay. Uh, is it all in the same place or uh, one to five places? Okay. Is it uh, one to 50 places? Is it more than 50 places? Okay, so middle. 
Uh, is it, do you know what it is and how old it is and who owns it? Uh, raise your hand if you do. Not bad. Uh, is it secure and do you worry about losing it? Uh, is it secure? <laughs> do you worry about losing it? Okay. Uh, do you need to share it? Everybody. Uh, right. Is it uh, one to five people slash departments? More than that? <coughs> do you rotate or retire your data? Not a lot. Uh, and do you know how much of it moves is duplicated and how often? Do you have any insight into that? <laughs> Just <you> know? Okay. <laughs> One poor soul. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I'm tired of the word big data, so I'm making it look like a swear word. Um, Slash programming, so that's a little bit more interesting than just big data. Uh, so that's one of the topic, um, explaining what it means to different people, because it doesn't mean the same thing to everyone. Uh, the next topic is um, it's no longer um, hype, uh, and it's no longer getting your feet wet. It's kind of like cloud five, seven years ago. Um, it is now uh, in production in a lot of places. And it's no longer just static data management um, with microservices. It's a lot of interaction between data without human involvement. Um, and then uh, the fun slide about history. Uh, I think you're going to like it. And the current landscape and the uh, more buzzwords like data lakes. Uh, I like them to call them ripples on the lake. Um, and what happens in the future, or at least what I think what happens. Definitions. So we like to start with numbers. Every time we work with a client, we ask them a lot of boring questions. Uh, like, what does it mean, data, for you? Is it a uh, typical NGS data set um, when it comes off the sequencer? Is it in the range of 100 to 500 gigabytes? Um, how frequently do you run your sequencer? Uh, is it 24-7? Uh, is it only five days a week? Is it run only once a week? How many sequencers do you have? Um, uh, do you consider this high throughput? Uh, do you have one of those fancy extends? Um, that all matters. Um, do you have any microscopes? Do you have any newest and greatest cryo, uh, which can be 24, 25 terabytes uh, per um, run uh, or per day? Uh, do you have any partner data sets? Uh, is it a one-time transfer where you just partnered with someone or acquired someone? And is it like 10 terabytes or about? Is it in the cloud? Um, are you streaming data uh, from instruments or uh, from any other technology? Um, do you do snapshots? Uh, how often do you do that? Do you need remote visualization? Uh, how far are the people that need access to the data? And access by people and by software are two very different things. People don't typically need access to a lot of data. Software might, and in parallel. So. The discussions that uh, we've been seeing are your instruments are in the lab. You really need to save that data as soon as it's generated. It's typically on local disk. Uh, it shouldn't stay on local disk because it'll fill up and then your instrument will stop producing data, it'll crash, it'll cost you 5,000 per run. That's not good. It needs to go somewhere. Uh, do you have enough space? Uh, for it to go somewhere. The instrument is probably one gig. You need to have adequate storage. If you have a dozen sequencers and they're all running at the same time, you need to make sure that storage is capable of receiving that data. Um, so you need to make sure there's adequate network connections and uh, at both ends. Then uh, you probably will not have central storage there. You'll probably have some sort of enterprise solution, which means your local instrument cache needs to transfer then data to some central location. So the rate at which the data is transferred is different between the instrument and that temporary location and then your centralized storage. It's probably going to be faster between that cache and centralized storage, a 10 gig, 40 gig maybe. Um, you really need to track the data as soon as it's generated. And typically with NGS runs, you already have some metadata in the text files. It really needs to be parsed right away and tracked throughout its lifetime, at least the project, if you are not doing anything else. Because uh, everybody talks about chargeback, and that's really where you need to start tracking the data. Um, and by now, no one does this manually. Uh, I mean, yes, people still write Python scripts uh, occasionally, but it's just too much work. It really should be automated and triggered by events and not by people. And I swear I did not see your slides before I wrote this. So we are just basically all think the same. <laughs> <laughs> so what does it mean that it's not static data management? 
I'm a system administrator, so uh, I've administered NetApps before. Um, NetApp for research is just not a good thing. Um, so POSIX file system with locking and a single location with two 10 gig connections is not gonna work for multi-site collaboration. Hopefully that's obvious to everyone by now. Um, without adequately distributed and replicated storage, uh, there will be network congestion uh, and duplication of data that is hard to track down. Uh, you really need to know where your data generates and where it needs to move before you start designing your storage solution. Uh, when it, that your data moves and uh, changes all the time, it's important to keep checking for consistency because networks are not reliable. So every time your data moves from point A to point B, you need to run checksumming. It takes time. Uh, that means it ideally needs to be built into your storage solution and uh, likely some sort of accelerator will be used for that. Encryption, same thing. Uh, it's done more and more and it also takes time on both ends. The automated workflows are generating more data faster than a human ever could. No one even thinks about that uh, because uh, everybody assumes that data is generated by humans. That is not the case anymore. There are more and more instruments. Prices are coming down. Um, the workflows on the data, uh, pre-processing, post-processing, uh, are frequently now triggered by data simply lending in an S3 bucket. Um, a, a lot of workflows in the cloud do that. No one logs in into an S3 bucket to do something with the data. It's an automatic workflow that does something to the data, then it moves somewhere else. And uh, that model in the cloud uh, is becoming more prevalent on-prem, or should be. So the fun slide. Uh, and again, I'm curious how many people here would remember this. Who wrote Perl scripts to traverse a POSIX file system to find out who owns the data and how old it is? <laughs> cool. Uh, did you ever uh, had to change ownership on all the files in the directory with more than a million files? Exciting, huh? Everything. Uh -huh. Uh, having to move 500 terabytes, pick arbitrary a large number, and uh, having to borrow equipment from the vendor to move to the new platform, right? <laughs> because no one thought about that. Um, moving data using Aspera, which is super efficient at moving data, and forgetting to set any sort of standards on your network and then bringing the whole enterprise network down. <laughs> I did this. <laughs> Enabling the duplication on the volume and not realizing that it's 70% full, so it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> which is funny to me because you are trying to make some room and you cannot, right? <laughs> um, and then finally getting a really fast network card and getting really excited and then the data is not moving because you really need a lot of drives on the other end as well. <laughs> Glad to see so many people have been through the same things. <laughs> okay, so Hadoop and Spark are no longer an experiment. A lot of companies are using it. Sometimes it's shadow IT, sometimes it's scientists just doing things on their own and it's working for them and the next thing you know it's in production. They are both not a temporary thing, they are staying. Uh, for a number of reasons, and they get their data from both structured and unstructured sources. And by structured, I mostly mean databases, but it could be something else. Um, it happens frequently and potentially on a schedule because sometimes when you have streaming data, it's coming in daily. Uh, and uh, if you have any sort of uh, hiccup uh, in that schedule, then you're potentially delaying a deadline and people are going to be really mad at you. Um, Visualization is now capable of driving those automatic workflows. People regularly use tools like Tableau or Click or Spotfire uh, to come up with an idea and then, uh, you know, scientists, they get excited and they want to implement it right away and it's a 500 terabyte data set and need to process it right away so the data needs to move. Um, and all of that needs to be versioned, snapshotted and tracked uh, because uh, scientists don't trust anyone and they want to know that it'll run exactly the same thing uh, or somebody else will be able to run exactly the same thing and reproduce the results. Um, and a lot of data sets come from partners. Uh, people outsource sequencing, they store it in S3 buckets and they want sometimes to bring it in-house or process it in the cloud or bring the data to the cloud. Uh, so it moves three ways. So what happens next? Uh, vendors used to be reluctant to take on more than their core expertise. Uh, that is changing. Uh, I work with a number of vendors that used to shut me down a number of years ago. They would just simply say no, and now they're thinking about it. They're saying, well, bring me more clients that want it, and we'll think about it. Um, frequently, uh, vendors have a lot of integrations when they don't have a staff in-house to get something done, so they're, they're a lot more open to partnerships. And I guess that's the acronym that Aaron was using, whatever, as a service license model uh, app store. 
uh, authentication authorization federation are becoming a lot more important. It used to be hacked together, and now uh, there is a lot more need for solutions. Uh, if a vendor doesn't have the greatest uh, technology built in, or at least a roadmap for something like that, there's less trust. It used to be the other way around. A vendor would come to you and say, have this thing, and you'd be like, no, we're enterprise, we don't do that, we'll wait three years. Um, now you really want to hear the buzzwords from the vendor to know that they are keeping up with the times. Um, and nothing is ever simple anymore. It's not just NFS. It's at least three different types of storage. It's local and remote. It's multiple clouds. It's uh, multiple vendors. Uh, it's actually kind of insane uh, how many things you have to work on uh, with daily. And it's not just research. A lot of it is in production. So what does it have to do with millennials? Uh, yes, I know there were other generations before millennials, uh, but in technology, I think for the first time I saw that term used as a thing to define people and the behavior in the workplace. And I'm sure you've seen <coughs> blogs about it, but um, I've seen it, so I believe it. They are changing how things are, and they're pretty annoying when they're doing it, but there's just no escaping it. <laughs> so you'll be in a meeting and they'll say something like, this is silly, and you're like, okay. Um, how am I going to talk to this person? Um, but that's what they do. And I actually like it because sometimes you'll spend a lot of time trying to convince somebody of something and it's futile and they'll just say it's silly and move on. They try new things fast. They're not scared of new things and they're not overwhelmed by new things. And they hate documentation but love version control. Um, so they're the people that are and will be implementing all of this technology for the next 20 years. So. Um, I know this sounds obscure, but I think a lot of organizations will have to change their culture. They don't have a choice. And as much as we're preaching about it, they're going to be forced to do it, whether they like it or not. That was awesome. We got a raft of questions asking for specific recommendations on lab, like managing lab data at the edge caching in toward a core or a commons, and standards to get back out to another edge and sandboxes. Are there specific things that you could recommend as, as to, to ease that pain point? There are no standards. There's sort of a short list of best practices. Um, the one very important thing that people forget, uh, instruments are usually windows. So uh, you're dealing with one gig and you're dealing with windows. So the easiest thing to do is mount uh, some sort of SIFS or a Samba share. That is super not performant and not reliable. Uh, so you definitely need tools, at least on the receiving end, to make sure that data did get there. Second, sometimes people install uh, uh, executables on the Windows system to make sure that the transfer happened uh, somewhat faster in a parallelized manner. Illumina <coughs> has tools for this. Um, uh, they allow you to install software to speed this up. There are no good tools currently that I know of um, that check things on the instrument side. So you definitely need to have something that manages this. We uh, like iRods. It's not easy to implement, but uh, it's kind of a unifying tool that does a lot of things, including data management and uh, registering the events when they happen and uh, has the ability to trigger something uh, that will uh, kick off after the data is received. Um, there are modules for checksumming. Uh, uh, configuration management like Ansible has things like that built in. Uh, makes it a lot easier. Uh, hopefully this answers the question. It does for me. <laughs> Other questions in the audience? Who wants to play catch? And or we have an old-fashioned microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be happy to bring it to you. Got someone in the middle? <laughs> Deb's fired. There you go. All right. It's challenging. So with uh, the millennial generation not having any reservations about putting their entire life online uh, in any number of uh, web-enabled uh, media, what do you think of the prospects over the next few years of all of this privacy infrastructure that we're now having to enable uh, because of, you know, obviously legislation? But when this generation passes through and becomes the lawmakers and says, genomic data, it's, who cares? It's, we may as well make it public. Uh, or any other, except for maybe a credit card and social security numbers. Now, how much of this uh, infrastructure that we spend uh, millions to billions of dollars 
uh, implementing do you think is just going to go away? Uh, anybody remembers PGP? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll finally be built in into everything. Yeah. I uh, personally uh, and. My colleagues will know this about me. I think privacy is a myth that we put a blanket over so that uh, we can all feel secure and hope that we can do things. The truth is, is that no matter what you do, if someone wants your stuff, they're going to get it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's why I'm I'm following this up with you know uh, security sobriety at the end, precisely for that reason, because there's different ways to do things, um, and such that your social security number and your credit card shouldn't matter, right? Um, uh, there should be additional security in place that doesn't let anyone else use it. We do have the ability to do that today, so. That's my personal opinion. I'll, I'll take a contrarian view on the millennial and privacy. I think um, if you see the way things are going, especially in the U.S., um, the first time a millennial gets denied health insurance because their genetic data uh, exposed a pre-existing condition or expensive record, uh, the first time they don't get a job offer because the employer buys a data set that suggests they might be expensive as an HR asset, I think the millennials will be pretty damn strong about their security <laughs> once they realize the sort of adverse outcomes that could affect their health insurance career and job prospects. I want to just second what Chris said, that I just think the privacy bubble hasn't popped for them. I really agree. And I don't have a LinkedIn or Twitter or anything else. So if you ever see anything with my name, it's fake. <laughs> <laughs> and as an old millennial, I just want to say that none of that applies to me. <laughs> that seems like a lovely time to work in uh, the blockchain question. <laughs> Which, I, I, I mean, I, my opinion is that it's at the absolute peak of the hype curve and we're about to enter the valley of disillusionment. But there's technology in there for, you know, securely, publicly exchanging private information, yep. you know, in a sustainable way. It, it, have you folks seen any meaningful application of blockchain technology that couldn't just have been, that couldn't have been done just as easily without blockchain? That wasn't a VC pitch? No, <laughs> not, not from my perspective, I haven't yeah. seen it. Have you seen the price on Bitcoin lately? <laughs> I think the attraction of blockchain and PGP is both decentralization. So decentralized security is going to have to be implemented in some way, shape, form, or fashion. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there are some interesting startup companies for microservices and things that are um, we're looking at that start to address this kind of global concept you were applying to blockchain. So we have to go there. Go ahead, Art. <coughs> Yeah, I, I think the most reasonable application so far is, is what Asya was just saying, is the decentralized security because of the Internet of Things, right? It's very unsecure, as everyone noted about six months ago. So um, I think that's where it can happen. It's an area open for innovation, that's for sure. Everybody jump in. We can throw microphones at you. <laughs> Actually, a, a kind of remarkable thing about this conference is that sometimes if you express a conference for a, a question or a concern or a pain point from this stage loudly and clearly enough, you show up next year and somebody sells it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. There it will be happened. a blockchain booth here next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <Bye>. All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's you. It's actually harder to talk for 12 minutes than to, you know, do 150 slides in 45 minutes. So um, I'm going to try to go relatively quickly and sanely here. Um, I just want to thank all you guys for showing up and also thank all the people sitting here at the table here. Um, this event is an outcome of, be of me being a whiny little baby about the trends from the trenches talk. Um, not only was I running out of interesting things to say, but um, I kept feeling that there were other people who had equal or more interesting stuff to talk about. And so I'm really, really happy to see this collection of, of sort of gnarly individuals up here. But there's other... Carl, Anushka, Billy, there's a whole bunch of other you that I think, you know, sometime next year, I think this table is going to extend out another six feet or so. So again, um, so I would say, so one of the things, this is an experiment. We're doing this for the first time. This seminar replaced a 45-minute monolithic talk by me. So be honest and brutal in your, in your evaluations. Um, I think we want to keep the kind of interesting content ideas going. So just definitely let us know how it's going. Let us know what you think. And um, like I said, I'm excited. It's better to have more voices speaking less than a boring, aging white dude just sort of monologuing at you. So 
All right, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm gonna do the cloud sobriety stuff mainly because um, I tend to talk about what I'm doing as a consultant, and for most of the last two years, um, I've been really, really deep in a massive enterprise migration to, uh, to Amazon. Um, we're talking about a, you know, a, a global multi-billion dollar entity, and for the first time, I'm having to deal with enterprise workloads and enterprise considerations rather than just forklifting science or high-performance computing or cherry-picking individual workloads in. So um, because I've been knee-deep in the cloud for so long, I figured I could do some of the cloud, the cloud sobriety stuff. So this slide here is just kind of outlining my own biases that influence the upcoming slides. Um, you know, a couple of basic truths here is that I'm, I really do start to feel like you know, the cloud questions the easy days are over. We've done the easy stuff. We know how to screen our vendors. We know how to pick cloud platforms. Um, in many cases, the proof of concepts, the workflow stuff, the easy days are over. We're, we're tackling the hard problems now. Um, the blunt truth, you know, from my perspective, from an infrastructure perspective, um, Amazon is still kicking the entire globe's butt when it comes to capabilities and features. The caveat there being that Azure and Google are absolutely fit for use and have, they've, been, they've been viable for a couple of years now. But if you're screening infrastructure, um, infrastructure clouds, in particular, you're weighing your vendors based on the sheer, the sheer number of feature services and the rate of innovation. It's not even close. Amazon still has a multiple year headed start on just about everybody else in the world. And the other sort of blunt truth is, um, I mean, I do admit that I work plainly in the enterprise and commercial space. Um, I haven't seen or touched an open stack environment in years. You know, the, the pox have dried up and blown away. The vendors are still talking about it, but I just don't see it at my customers. So the dangers are, are still generally there. Um, if it's still easy to waste fantastic amounts of money, um, the people who are wasting the biggest amounts of money are the people who are led by those executives who sort of excrete the words cloud first onto a PowerPoint slide without actually doing any due diligence or research or even math. Um, the amount of money you can waste on the cloud is phenomenal. I mean, you're talking six-figure sums a month easily if you've got a mismanaged or poorly applied cloud environment. And so I think because of that, you are, I, I alluded to this last year, there's some stuff I really can't sort of talk about in public, but um, you are going to start to see cloud pullbacks. Um, and this will be because we have the actionable data, we have the billing data, we know the true costs. We now are in a position where we have the data to figure out which workload to run on-prem, which storage to keep on-prem, and which stuff to run in the cloud. So you'll start to see some sort of major migrations. I still think the interesting thing is the cloud pullbacks are not necessarily going to go from public cloud back to on-prem. There's all sorts of interesting public-private co-location facilities. Um, government supercomputing sites are trying to become revenue neutral. So I can actually see workloads coming out of public clouds and going to like NCSA iForge or TAC or maybe a bunch of life sciences people in Boston ganging together and putting a bunch of shared stuff in like one of the Markley data centers or you know one of the sort of common gathering grounds for IT infrastructure in the Boston area. Uh, the other thing I'd mention is that it's, it's relatively rare that I get a chance to, to build a cloud environment new. Most of my consulting work these days is existing cloud footprints that need new capabilities, new services, or need to be fixed. You know, like we're sort of past the days of bootstrapping entire companies into a cloud footprint. It feels like you know, we've, we've hit that peak a couple of years ago. The last point is important. Um, I, you guys know me. If you've seen me speak before, I'm pretty cynical and crusty. And I in, I, in particular, I hate when vendors play fast and loose with the truth. We saw that happen with HPC. We saw that, we saw that happen with grid computing. We saw that happen with petascale storage. It's now happening in the third-party ecosystem surrounding cloud. There are vendors who should know better, like Red Hat, who are being fast and loose with the truth. So you need to sort of prove out and do the due diligence on, particularly in the third party ecosystem, don't trust the pre-sales marketing material. You have to trust, well, all right, trust but verify, I think is, is the word to say. And like I said, I, you'd expect it from kind of the small fly-by-night shops, but there are very large established companies that are towing the line of proprietary in, in, in many cases. So um, I, I'm going to skip this solve things and go quickly right into sort of what works. All right, you know, the infrastructure platforms have been fit for use for a long time. I actually don't feel the R&D and scientific workloads are all that hard anymore. Um, there's technical challenges, but um, we've been putting scientific workflows and individual cherry pick stuff onto cloud environments for a very long time. You know, the issues now are data management or data movement. Um, the technical bits are, lar are largely solved. Um, I think data, not metadata aware storage or data management, that's still an unsolved problem, but the act of ingesting, moving, and exchanging large amounts of data feels a little bit like a solved problem. With the right set of tools, it largely comes down to the speed of my pipe. There's not a lot of technical barriers these days anymore, aside from maybe cost and the size of my pipe. I think the securities question is really, really interesting. From an infrastructure perspective, the building blocks are there. I can build an environment that is as encrypted as as secure as I want. It's still a pain in the ass to do it. It's hard, it requires expertise. Um, monitoring the compliance and monitoring the state changes is a little bit harder, but I think from a security perspective, the building blocks are there. It's been a long time since there was a fundamental security or encryption or key management capability that I really needed that just simply didn't exist. I think the building blocks are there. And then finally, one of the things I've noticed is that when you read the kind of cloud propaganda, everybody 
talks about sandbox and dev test and all these, you know, you know what's the first thing you should do to the move to the cloud? Um, if, you po if you focus particularly on Amazon, I actually kind of, I'm starting to feel, based on my enterprise work, um, the lowest hanging fruit is relational databases. Um, moving your, your, your relational data stores into a managed services on, you know, on Amazon or something like that, the, the ROI is almost instant. And starting to work with some of the layered stuff like the database migration service and everything else, I'm, I'm starting to feel that for a company that is just getting onto the cloud, dumping those relational data stores into a managed services environment where they're clustered, they're highly available, you've got read replicas, you don't have to care about backups. They can restore point in time, any point back in the last 15 days. There's a lot of crazy operational stuff that is just simply fixed. Um, and I, I'm starting to feel like you know, databases might be one of the overlooked uh, uh, low-hanging fruits right now on the cloud. So um, I, I'm going to talk about some of the mistakes and what's still really hard. Um, I refer to these as extinction level errors. Um, there are absolutely situations where you can get into where it makes sense to blow up your cloud environment and start fresh from scratch. The vast majority of them have to do with getting the network bits wrong. I won't read the list here, but um, I will say if you have any one of these problems on this list, you are better off. It, rather than incur a technical debt by creating workarounds, there's multiple environments where you're simply just nuke, nuke the thing, rebuild it from scratch, and move on. And it generally comes down to either network design or VPC or interconnections to the various cloud environments. If you get that wrong, blow it up, start fresh, move on. Uh, it's just too hard to fix and move around. This is just an example. One of the nice things on, you know, in Red is monitoring the different cloud subs is this is an example of a, you know, an extinction level event. You, you stand up a VPC, you stand up your Docker bridge, and the Docker bridge uses the exact same subnet as your VPC, which means all network communication completely falls. You can't route, you can't talk to the internet. This is an example. Blow the VPC away, pick a new internet, uh, pick a new IP subnet range, install Docker, move on with your life. The other thing that's happening is it's very easy to talk about least privileged security, and the cloud gives us the ability to do fine-grained security controls that are just amazing. They, this is one of the areas where the cloud capability far exceeds what we can do on-prem in an enterprise environment. The problem is, is that the talk doesn't necessarily match what you can do in the real world. At the end of the day, all of this role-based access, this least privileged model, if, if you take it to an extreme, it's individual security policies for every employee, every uh, software application, and every server, and that simply doesn't scale. Really what it comes down to is you're going to end up devolving into kind of a hybrid compromise solution. The single biggest mistake with the security model is um, baking in a rigid security model on day one. Um, security is always changing. You always have new methods, new tools, and new technologies. And so the biggest thing you can do is build into your cloud plans and cloud operational practices the ability to change up, alter, and sort of refresh your different security postures. Um, I can't, I've lost count of the number of times we put all these rigid controls in place only to have them blown away by day two or day three as sort of the real world you know, hits, the, hits the cloud environment. Um, I'm going to skip the perimeter security stuff, except to say my single biggest beef with Amazon right now is um, you can't use the cloud features, including Amazon's APIs, without talking to the internet. Um, that is a real problem if you're trying to build a hard shell environment. The solution is what Amazon calls VPC endpoints, but they've only got it for S3 globally and DynamoDB in a couple of regions. Um, we really, really need to build isolated, secure cloud environments that can talk to the cloud APIs without going out on the internet. And that's, that's just a major operational hassle for us right now. It's solvable, it's just a pain in the ass to deal with. Um, the other big issue is that Cloud capabilities are so big and so large that you have to bring a lot of people to the table. However, when you bring a lot of very senior people to the table who don't know a lot, um, you end up with having improper suggestions or improper designs that become baked into your cloud footprint that get hard to fix. I'm not going to read the slide here, but um, the problem is, is that every single one of these stakeholders belongs at the table, but if they're not fully trained up on the cloud capabilities for the vendor that you've talked about, um, there are very, very nasty repercussions or just ill-advised suggestions that are going to end up in your design. The other thing that I'm starting to run into, and this comes into like serverless and Lambda and Athena, is that um, there's a lot of organizations that are very process bound and they have you know, a culture that assumes a server exists, a configuration database exists. Um, there are cloud capabilities, particularly the server stuff, that just have no native on-prem ortholog. And that causes an institutional hard stop, um, particularly when all of your documentation assumes something has a host name or has a configuration database entry. Um, there's a lot of sort of operational issues dealing with the serverless stuff that are more cultural related than technological related. Um, it's becoming a, a hassle, particularly in the larger, older legacy organizations. 
Cost optimization, we ha like I said, we have the data, we know how to do it. The problem is that it's incredibly difficult to analyze. Um, the third-party ecosystem tools for monitoring cloud spend and optimizing your spend, they're getting better. They're still difficult to deal with. Um, a really great recent write-up within the last couple of days is this URL down at the bottom. Um, just read it to cover all of the gory details this one company had to do to sort of cost optimize. The payoff is they save a million bucks a year in OPEX. So it's worth doing, but the engineering that they had to do was incredibly difficult, and it's not something you typically think of early on in your cloud design process. All right, I've got a minute left. I might actually finish vaguely on time. All right. So my hardest problem right now when it comes to cloud and enterprise is, has nothing to do with technology. Um, the hardest part is dealing with the cultural and sort of bureaucratic IT procedures um, and mapping them to the cloud where things are elastic, agile, where we've got servers that are disposable that might only live for a couple of minutes. Um, it's, it's actually the hardest part is the sort of cultural cat herding to change documentation, processes, configuration management, um, security reviews, that's like that, to sort of take advantage with the fact that the problem is, is that if you don't adapt the organization, you lose a lot of the cloud benefits. You can't use elastic stuff on the cloud. You can't use auto scaling. You can't use uh, disposable stuff. You can't use serverless infrastructure because your org simply is not capable of dealing with those sort of those weird paradigms. I've got a couple examples here. I think for time reason, I won't read them. But you know, issue number one, if you're using a provisioning middleware, there's a lot of tools that will build cloud infrastructure for you. If it takes six months for your provisioning middleware to take advantage of the latest Google release or Amazon release, you've got a problem. Your users are going to be mad or upset. Um, if your provisioning requires a human being to sign a piece of paper and shuttle it around the organization, you lose a lot of benefits of the sort of deploy in minutes and, and you're back to sort of deploying in weeks or deploying in days. And not a big deal, but I think really the point that I want to get across is that um, unless you fix the organizational stuff, you can't benefit from the major cloud advantages. You lose a lot of that agility, elasticity, and ability to sort of react relatively quickly. I've just got a whole bunch of examples here, and, and I think for time reason, I'm not going to do it. One of the big ones when it comes to time wasting, though, or money wasting, is this mid middle bullet point here. Um, legacy IT architectures assume a one-to-one -one ratio between application server and application. It's really easy to forklift that. It's actually darn easy to, it's the lazy person's way to do it. The end result is you're just wasting tons of money. You know, you, you, you have to sort of combine the forklift approach with, all right, how can we refactor, how can we architect to be a little bit more sensible in how we do things. Um, all right, so finally wrapping up, you know, in, in terms of real world, we've seen some assumptions about this. I know uh, Chris talked about it in his talk earlier. Um, for me, multi-cloud is starting to be things like, I think identity is going to be in Azure AD, or identity might be at Office 365, and I think my business processes and science are probably going to run in a mixture of Microsoft, Google, and Amazon environments. So for me, multi-cloud is not applications spanning multiple clouds. For me, real-world multi-cloud is my identity federation lives in cloud A, my business processes are running in clouds B, C, and D. I think that, to me, is realistic multi-cloud in an enterprise setting. And then finally, I want to end this talk with things that I'm sort of excited about. Um, if you stop by our booth or you've seen stuff, um, Amazon's new service, Athena, the ability to drop a file, a piece of scientific data into an object store and execute SQL queries against your random data in an object bucket, no Hadoop, no Elastic MapReduce, no Spark stuff. Um, the ability to ask SQL-based queries against scientific data residing in an object store, no server required, no Hadoop required, is game-changing. You're going to see a ton of interesting Athena-related stuff coming out in the future. I'll skip the Bioteam Skunk Work stuff, except I'll say um, the other two things I'm excited about, we talked about iRods and metadata management. Um, Star, uh, Starfish, if you guys have seen the Starfish booth, I should congratulate them on their Best in Show awards. Um, Starfish is something I'm really, really interested in getting hands on with. And then the other thing is um, Singularity, I think, is also in the sort of top of the hype curve right now. But in terms of container-based handling of scientific information, uh, Singularity, I think, seems to solve a lot of the pain points that kept me away from containers and Docker stuff uh, for quite some time. All right, that's it. I am all set. Thank you guys very much. I think we have a few more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and ask the question that uh, is at the top of the list right now. Yes, and then, and you kept hitting on it. It's uh, if the organization needs to shift in order to take full advantage of the cloud features and architectures and re-architecting and everything. Who within the organization can the CEO hold accountable for the infrastructure, which is now this multi-hybrid cloud thing? Who is, yep. how, how does that work in the best run places? It's kind of funny. Um, I think IT should be responsible for the guardrails, the security, the operations, the tagging, and the cost management. I think the responsibility of infrastructure devolves now onto the users, the scientists, and, and the, the individuals. So I think the, the, the role of the cloud in the future is it's our job as IT people to construct the safe guardrails, to provide all of the training 
and resources, but we're actually giving the keys to the infrastructure to the users. I want my users to turn on machines. I want them to turn, the, I want them to turn off their, their continuous integration server at five o'clock on Fridays to save money. Um, so I think really the short answer is um, IT is responsible for operations, security, guardrails, cost optimization, all the boring stuff, um, and probably compliance and monitoring, but it, responsibility for infrastructure devolves onto the user. I think that's, that's where we're going to see it. Questions from the audience? I'll skip on to the Questions from the panel. We, we just really want to throw the catch boxes at you, so ask questions. <laughs> All right. Well, if there aren't any questions, we'll oh. just move on. Keep sending the questions to slide.io. Um, we built a lot of time into the schedule to sort of keep this thing interactive and to keep you guys from falling asleep. And, Actually, uh, I'm going to pin you there for just another okay. sec. Yep. This is such a, a, a rubber meeting the road question. Yep. Is MPI at end of life? Wait, so, uh, say that again? MPI. No, all right, so, so MPI is not at end of life because we probably have eight or nine years of computational chemistry and, and molecular modeling software that will still continue to run it. And um, so I think what you're going to see is a uh, very, very long tail. We'll be running MPI now. The, the real issue is um, whether or not there will be a lot of new MPI codes written or whether the new, written, the new MPI codes that are being written are latency sensitive. The big issue in IT is do I run AP MPI on very expensive low latency, low latency interconnects like InfiniBand? For chemistry and molecular modeling, absolutely. For bioinformatics and computational biology, the stuff runs just as well on Ethernet as it does on InfiniMed. So actually, the, the short answer is, yeah, MPI is going to be around for at least eight or nine more years because we've got a huge legacy code base. Same question for HPC schedulers. HPC schedulers, until we have everything that always has a RESTful API everywhere, HPC schedulers are going to be around for a long time. I, so I, you know, I, I'm doing less and less grid engine consulting and less and less grid engine training as the days go on, but we're still building grid engine into Amazon. Amazon has recognized the business need, and they now have Amazon Batch. So I think traditional schedulers are going away, but again, it's long tail, six, seven, eight, ten years probably. You know. Okay, so if you had to make a bet and pick one. Pick which one would die first? Uh, which one's going to live? <laughs> um, Which is your favorite child? You know, honestly, I, I think MPI might live longer because there are, mm. so the, the whole process of HPC schedulers is just task distribution based on a resource allocation policy, and there's probably a dozen different ways we can tackle that problem. So I think someone's going to come out with a better scheduler, and someone will come out with a better way of distributing tasks according to a policy. So I think if, if you pin me to it, cluster schedulers will disappear faster than MPI and message passing interfaces. I would add, too, that I think um, for uh, microservice orchestration, um, cloud and multi-cloud, that's yeah. actually going to move closer to messaging and events and MPI. Yeah. And um, the new yeah. MPI that we always waited for for decades may actually emerge out of all that. There's whole new realms of scheduling that need to be created at this point. Yeah. Cool. All right. I think we're still on time. We got one question. Right. All right. <laughs> nice. Nice. Okay, so um, uh, this this is a little bit off off track, but I, I think this is a really important question. So um, we've we've heard a lot about how unique these technologies are, in particular how unique these millennials seem to be in terms of driving innovation, et cetera. So so my question is, um, when when it comes to the, the the people who are unicorns in these in these industries in these companies, right? You, uh, how do we actually? make them to be less unicorny. We, we get more people with that mix of skill sets and stop treating uh, this, this kind of stuff that we're talking about here as really novel and special and, and shiny and brand new. I think bio team people have eight different answers to that question, but um, also my take is um, my particular pet peeve um, really comes down to sort of education and training and discrimination against an aging workforce and things like that. And really what I, what I come down to is um, unicorns are very, very expensive to hire, maintain, and treat. And unicorns are in heavy desire. They're being hired across industry. I'm a huge fan of solving the unicorn problem by investing in my existing workforce, additional training, existing certification, knowledge transfer. Um, I, I, Bioteam has a huge, we have, a, there, there are multiple success stories from taking young kids and training them up and having them turn into unicorns, but you can also take long-time employees, retrain them, reskill them, and again, you get unicorns out of it. So I think, for me, the answer to the unicorn problem is invest in the workforce and train up your internal people, because the unicorns are going to be, the unicorns can go, can walk and go anywhere and they're expensive. Um, it's better, rather than buy or hire the next unicorn, you should be growing the unicorns in your, in your organization. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and ju just to quickly follow up, I, I think I totally agree. I think the actual problem is that, you know, a lot of the stuff we do has no formal training in the industry, right? Um, HPC, there are no HPC certification programs out there, right? You just happen to learn it if you happen to learn, uh, work in that environment. Uh, you know, same, same thing with, uh, you know, large-scale hyper 
performance networking and uh, you know things like that. And so, so this integration pattern is really, really hard to find. Um, we know because we try to hire them, right? And so um, you know the, the, the other thing, though, is that um, I think the thing that the workforce does not identify, um, or at least the hiring process does not identify, is, it, is implicit talent. Right, uh, talent, the thing that you're born with, what can you do? Are you curious? Are you self-motivated? Uh, do you want to expand your learning beyond uh, the, the walls that have been put up around you? Um, those people are very, are much easier to train in this than the people who aren't, right? And so that, that identification, I think, would come out by formal training as well. So. Uh, I've seen practical uh, implementations of this in several companies, and uh, sometimes it's mandatory shadowing of someone in another department, so it's not left up to people. They, there is a policy that says three months out of a year, you are not doing your job. You're in another department following someone, helping them to the degree that you can, and then you come back to your old job. That's just one example that I've seen that works. Yeah, don't let your unicorns kind of stay in the high tower away from everyone. Yep. It's proximity, you know, so you take a bunch of ponies and put them in proximity with the unicorn. <laughs> that equation equals, it equals more unicorns. That's what I had to What do. about donkeys? <laughs> <laughs> And I, I would lead on this a little bit as well, because as consultants, when we get hired, it is frequently, 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 because you have a process that requires this particular person. You know, this particular person is the only one who knew exactly the right triple of skills. Well, as a senior leader in an organization, look out for that. That's a flawed organization. Yep. You know, if you find yourself needing to hire only people who are very, very difficult to find, well, it, it is staff rotations, yes, and different ways of building tools, too. You know, the whole, like, DevOps, Agile, Kanban, bring the entire team together horizontally, coupled with a strong path, uh, practice of staff rotations. You know, I don't think we should have the cult of the single person who's, who's brilliant, who's the only one who could do it. You know, I think that we should make processes that are runnable by humans. <laughs> by the way, the guy who asked that question is a unicorn. He's uh... <laughs> I don't want to be the only unicorn. I want all of you guys to be unicorns. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I can't follow that, by the way. <laughs> All right, and now for something completely different. <laughs> so, uh, so I've been really thinking a lot about uh, leadership and this idea of you know, extreme ownership in bio IT or in converged IT. And I think you know, as leaders, we have to take ownership of everything that impacts our scientific mission, right? So in bio IT, I think this means taking ownership of the network and how it performs, the security, the infrastructure, and how it all comes together to support the science. You know, so great leaders take yeah, accept full responsibility for failure and aren't interested in taking credit for the success, you know. So I kind of believe that there are no bad teams, there are only bad leaders, right? And this applies at all levels of an organization from senior level to junior level teams within teams, okay? So hopefully these kind of principles broadly apply to you. So I've always thought of bio team as uh, Navy SEALs. I don't know why we used to say that. We're probably more like an army or something now. Uh, but you know, I still identify as Navy SEALs, right? And I think the origin of, of uh, the SEALs is kind of interesting. So uh, in World War I, you know, the military was losing a lot of Marine and Army troops due to failed beach landings, right? So the Navy had kind of realized that they had to clear the beach so they could provide you know, defense on the coast and get the Army on land, right? And that was kind of tricky to do. So they initially formed this underwater demolition team. And this was the first time the Navy actually bridged the gap between the water and the land, okay? And so they saw this new need for unconventional warfare going into World War II. And science kind of requires, you know, unconventional IT, right? We have special IT operations, the unicorns we were just talking about. So what we really need are like T-shaped systems engineers, you know, people who can go broad and deep, right? And in close proximity to the science. So I like to force analogies down people's throats. So uh, <laughs> let's take, uh, you know, the data is obviously the sea. It's the data lake, right? Data is vast and data is apparently wet. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, air, air is the infrastructure, right? Because, you know, good infrastructure should just be invisible. Uh, and it's everywhere. And we also need it, right? Um, and then science is like the land, you know? And I consider the scientists like the ground troops, okay? And so we've heard you know, over the past couple of days of all these huge challenges that we face, right? And everything is like really hard, right? And I think the answer is just in building really high performance teams like we were just talking about. You know, teams that engage in unconventional ways, they bridge the gap, you know? they aggressively remove roadblocks. Uh, they are best practice, right? And they're diverse by their very nature. So you know, extreme ownership is about making no excuses 
And I think these are the kind of teams that we have to try to build to solve the problems in this space. So it really starts with winning the war within, right? Uh, it's you against you first, right? And so strong leadership really starts with believing in the science. And you have to understand the why. You know, why am I doing this, right? And, you know, Chris used to say you can't just tour the lab once a year. You actually have to sit side by side with scientists and understand what they're doing, you know? Uh, you have to ask why until you understand and interrogate this, you know, environment. Do root cause analysis. Understand how scientists are problem solving, right? And so I also think incentive is really important, right? Um, you have to be able to answer that question, is it worth it? Is what we're doing worth it, right? And if you can't answer that, you're going to have really pro a big problem, you know, um, aligning up and down the chain of command. So implementing extreme ownership really requires checking your ego, right? Who here doesn't have an ego? Um, <laughs> ego, you know, clouds your judgment, right? And, you know, the ego hates trade-offs. Um, your team should operate with a high degree of humility, um, taking on the challenges that other people don't want to, okay? And I think that's why we're all here, right? Like Aaron said, this is, these challenges are great, and this makes this space great, you know? Um, Zen Buddhism has this concept of, you know, the beginner's mind, right? This attitude of openness. You're eager to learn, and you're eager to lead, right? And I think that's what really separates people in this space. Um, you're eager to lead, and you also have a lack of preconceptions, you know? So it's like, it's attitude and mindset. I think that's what we were just talking about. These are really important when you build teams that support science, mindset and attitude. You can't be too good to fail um, or afraid to fail, really. You know, people like to say failure is not an option. That's bullshit. Failure is an option, and it's just learning, right? Um, good in, you know, a good example of ego getting in the way is, you know, what I like to call big data envy or, or high performance envy, right? And Aaron talked about this. You know, it's like building some giant Hadoop cluster for an analysis that could have probably been done with a multi-threaded Perl script, right? Um, <laughs> just because Facebook or Google does it that way doesn't mean that you should do it that way, right? Solve your own problems. So another leadership principle is, is simplicity, right? For some reason, people really like to buy complexity. You know, it's like, but the simpler you keep your planning and your overall strategy, I think the better your outcomes are. Uh, complexity looks great on diagrams and on feature lists, right? But it really hurts when things start to go wrong. Uh, and the plan should be understood by the lowest common denominator on your team. Otherwise, it's a non-starter, right? You should, uh, you, your team should feel free to ask questions until they understand, right? Simple planning is easier to adjust in a rapidly changing environment. So oftentimes, solutions are too complex. I think we should be thinking about, you know, power to weight ratio and what that means in, in hardware and software and things. You know, how can we be lightweight, flexible, and powerful? Did I skip a slide? No. All right, so uh, DevOps really needs something like decentralized command. You know, SEAL teams are known for this. They assemble fire teams, which are just building blocks of four to six people max, right? One person can't manage 25, 30 people. It just doesn't make sense. You have to empower junior leaders to make decisions and take initiative. Uh, you can't constantly check in with everyone. So this requires simplicity in your planning. Otherwise, things will spiral out of control. And it relies on more than just a mission statement. You know, everyone has a mission statement. You have to understand why. Um, don't let them ask, you know, um, don't tell them what to do, right? Have them tell you, this is what I'm going to do, right? And it's, it's tricky, so let them adapt. And again, take a look at an org chart, you know? Does it even exist? Uh, is it current? Uh, is it clear? And, you know, are regular folks even allowed to see that, right? It's kind of interesting. So, you know, this idea of discipline and discipline and freedom are kind of opposing forces that have to be balanced, you know? Uh, we can't be so rigid in process that we can't adapt and good leadership is about you know, making rapid decisions based on the situation. Uh, every situation's unique, will inevitably change, so you gotta be swift and ready to adjust. Um, another example is you know, choosing a configuration management system. People will fight for years over Chef versus Puppet versus Ansible, whereas if you had just picked one and went, you'd be way ahead of the competition, right? So don't spend time uh, wasting, you know, waste time over those decisions. So every you know, DevOps journey is unique. It's, it's not about technical change, uh, it's about, you know, a change in our culture and the way that we work, solving your own problems, like I said, trying new things and failing, not being afraid to fail, sharing your experiences, right? People talk about tools, but I don't think tools are that important. You know, they all suck, some suck less. Um, and DevOps isn't just automation, it's people and processes. And you know, you can't just create a third silo. You can't create a DevOps team that doesn't talk to any of the other teams. That, that doesn't make sense, you just created a new problem. So really effective DevOps requires that kind of discipline, you know, a team that has disciplined procedures, the more freedom they have to use things like decentralized command. And there's always that temptation to kind of take the easy path, uh, but we have to consider, you know, long-term strategy, 
um, even if it takes more time, right? We have to make time, you know, get up early. You know? uh, working ad hoc and being lazy about your process is really not an option. Um, standardizing and agreeing on fundamental procedures are key. Um, how you start projects, how do you finish, how are you gonna communicate, right? This stuff matters when things start to go south. So you really kind of fall back on those fundamentals. And when those fundamentals are really solid, now you have all this freedom to be creative within that framework. So this might be stupid, but I'm starting to think that real uh, networking <laughs> in IT is kind of like wrestling in martial arts, okay? Um, especially wide area networking, because networking is like really hard. It requires hard work. You actually have to dig like real trenches in the ground and break through brick walls, like literally. <laughs> and, uh, and most things in tech really aren't like that, right? So, so networking is very intimidating to people. I find this very interesting. Uh, you know, we interview and talk to a lot of people and networking is one of those things that people tend to be really weak at and they're also really f afraid of, you know? So like simultaneously, everyone's afraid of it, but they also wish they were better at it, right? So how many people are like, man, I wish I had experience with BGP routing and bro and 100 gig switching, right? Everybody wishes they had that experience. Just like in martial arts, everyone's like, man, I should have wrestled in high school, right? That's what everybody says. So you don't relate to that, to that, uh, you don't relate to that but I do. So uh, <laughs> anyways, it's, you know, and networking is also like really simple in theory, right? It's got like straightforward physics, bits, bytes, packets, easy to understand, and then it gets really complex in the real world, right? Just like wrestling. Anyways, so we'll, let's look at a few trends. Uh, you know, one of the biggest is evolving VPCs and network designs. Just like I said, networking is a big deal right now, and the evolving network design in the cloud uh, is, is getting interesting. So a few years ago, this is what VPCs might have looked like. You know, a single region with a couple subnets, life was good. Uh, but we finally had advanced networking uh, options to connect our on-premise network, and so this was all great, right? But networking, to, you know, the cloud today is looking like this, right? So the success of those early environments pushed us into more complex scenarios. Um, this is what you know, VPC might look like now. And in these environments, IP planning, routing, all the stuff uh, Chris talked about is, becomes non-trivial, right? And these highly connected environments require engaging with enterprise network teams and uh, making tough decisions about firewalls and equipment and procedures and ownership, right? It's all about ownership. Again, some of these folks are the same people that are riding Cisco certifications and can pretty, be pretty smug about cloud, but we have to work with these people. Otherwise, we're really not gonna get our jobs done. So, you know, DevOps should be about sharing and evolving best practices, and I think, uh, you know, best, codifying your best practices allow you to kind of define your infrastructure DNA. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but we like Terraform, and I think tools like this allow you to, you know, manage your infrastructure as code, uh, publish best practices. I'd like to see more of this stuff, but in scientific computing, you know, sharing best practices, sharing infrastructure recipes and templates so that we can all kind of uh, raise the level. I'm really getting tired of the phrase infrastructure as code, so I decided to kind of create a new one here. <laughs> um, so, you know, what about, you know, infrastructure meta programming or like meta infrastructure programming, right? The idea that you have code that writes code that emits infrastructure, right? So this is, it gets pretty meta, I think, and I think this is maybe where things are going. So you might have code that creates templates, inputs, inputs to templates spawn infrastructure. So there's not this one-to-one -one relationship. People say infrastructure as code, but it's not one-to-one, -one, right? You have one template that's emitting new environments constantly, right? So that's kind of interesting. Um, I think in those environments, we can encode the compliance, right? We can have infrastructure that's you know, uh, self-policing and self-modifying, right? So I think that's really interesting, and I think goes beyond just saying infrastructure as code. It's something a little more. I'm not sure what it is, though. So again, people wanted to talk about functions as a service. I'm just gonna breeze through it. Um, it's here to stay. Um, it's enabled some really cool stuff right out of the gate. People were jumping all over Lambda. And really, again, it's just a byproduct of hyper-converged infrastructure. You get to run your code on the same platform as the storage. Um, you know, Lambda's pretty amazing. Um, I won't say too much more about it. We'll talk about it later. I think you can do all kinds of things with this. Genomics workflows, metadata extraction, a QA and compliance checks, data transformations, all kinds of really cool stuff. So I like this idea I heard at reInvent of chaos engineering. Uh, Netflix really talks about this and puts out a lot of open source. And it's the discipline of experimenting on a distributed system in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent conditions in production. Right? So the idea is that you build some large distributed system, then you find creative ways to try to break it. Right? And uh, each time it breaks, you learn something, and then you run more experiments. And so. Uh, some might call this robustification, which I don't think is a word, but I think Merle Giles from the NCSA said that. I like it. So robustification, or uncovering weaknesses, you know, finding holes in your game. Um, it's an inoculation against failure. And I think it's really interesting. So, and you'll find things in these failures, like retry storms, and cascading failures, and new single points of failure. Uh, you have these interesting cloud effects of like internal DOS attacks that happen when certain things go down, right? It's really interesting stuff. You can simulate this, and you can experiment around this. 
Uh, next, Netflix has a cool, couple cool open source tools. Chaos Monkey randomly terminates EC2 instances in your environment. I'm sure you've heard of that. Um, but you might have not have heard of uh, Chaos Kong, which just nukes an entire AWS region and you have to evacuate, right? <laughs> that would have actually inoculated a lot of people against the East outage, and, but nobody was doing it, right? Um, and then, you know, Latency Monkey is cool because you can inject random latency between all of your microservices and see what happens, right? So I think that's really fun and interesting stuff. And so, you know, every talk has to talk about culture. And we talk about Bioteam as a company, but companies are really just ideas, right? And so Bioteam is just an idea. An idea that I think represents the highest standard of IT supporting science, uh, bridging the gap, holding ourselves to high standards, and then putting it all together with hard work. So, you know, last year at this conference, someone called Dag a superhero. And I think to a lot of people, he, you know, he is a hero, right? Because in nature and physiology, you know, pain trumps everything in nature. So therefore, any attempt to alleviate pain trumps everything. And so a hero isn't somebody with superpowers. It's, a, it's someone who fights through the pain so that someone else doesn't have to suffer. And so I'm realizing Bioteam is kind of like a cult, uh, but a cult of love. Love for science and uh, love for science with the determination and the firepower to get it done. It's about going beyond, you know, just compassion for science, right? It's, you know, your happiness is my happiness, like truly. Like let's collapse the duality mindset. Um, it's not us versus them. It's, you know, all of us together. So, all right, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome yep. to the cult. <laughs> you're, all, you're all invited. So we got a question that I really like, and it, it bounces into how to work with teams. The question is, when you're creating a platform, and they picked data lakes as their example, how much of your, your starting point is the infrastructure that you either have or that you could have, and how much of it is um, who you are already related to in terms of vendor relationships, partners, you know, on, on the ground expertise? You've got stuff that you could have and you've got what people already know and who you're already close to. How do you balance those? Man, okay, so the question is how to balance between people, vendors you're already using yeah. versus yeah. Do you, where, do you start what you want to buy? Or do you start with the technology your team already knows? Mm. Hmm? Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. it's kind of like getting back to the unicorn thing, I guess. Like, do you kind of build people up into these specialized roles? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, I think roles and stuff kind of can go away. I'm more interested in people that are building tools and building new things. So, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer other than uh, build good teams, and I think they'll figure it out. That's a cop-out. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm going to quote. Someone else uh, jump in, please. Yeah. I'm going to quote Dune on this one. Uh, fear is the mind killer. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's actually on my last slide, or something related to it. But uh, you know, the the thing is, we shouldn't be afraid of things, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't I don't think there's any use in saying, but we already know this, and we can force this to do this. It's going to take a lot more effort, but we can force this to do it. Why not take the adventure of learning something new and trying something new? And it's that fear of failure that that pre prevents everybody from doing that. Versus, try it. It's okay if it doesn't work, right? That's an opportunity to change and innovate and, uh, and level up uh, your team in a way that makes you more extensible, more cross-functional. So um, that's my feeling. Yeah. I'll, be, I'll be slightly contrarian and say that um, I think there's a tremendous value to institutional knowledge and incumbent vendors, products, and technologies. So I think um, they win the battle in the default sort, and then you move away when your business science or technical requirements preclude. Uh, the specific example in Bioteam is there's a lot of reasons to use networking vendors other than Cisco, but there is a tremendous built-in you know, skill set, knowledge base, tech base, where the barrier to switching away from a vendor like Cisco is really, really huge. So it's easy for consultants to be glib about that, but in the real world and enterprise, it's difficult choice. So I, I think for me, the default choice is incumbent knowledge, incumbent vendors, incumbent products, and you switch when there is a business science or technical reason uh, to do so. Yeah. And that is a hard thing to balance, the, the curmudgeon versus the person who's in infinite awe of the new things, right? And so you kind of have that uh, dichotomy get, there. But, you know, it, basics, right? So basics still work. And so I think you can always try new things and then bring that back into what you already know. So I don't think trying new things throws out the old stuff, right? I think it just adds to your completeness uh, of, you know, of what you know. I was, yeah, that's perfect. And I mean, I, I was going to say you can fall into a pit either way. I actually think neither, neither apply when you're considering this. It's, it's an engineering question of do you have an elegant uh, engineering solution um, composing together, I guess, for your platform or what have you. If you have institutional knowledge and experience, great. 
to Chris's point, you know, that's a path of least resistance. I actually think you could quantify that as an engineering consideration. But if you, um, you know, just have things that you're trying to shoehorn together, to Ari's point, um, you know, that, that won't lead to the, the best solution. I think we're in a world right now where as we're all connected in the community at the same time, um, we watch uh, engineering solutions uh, end up winning. Um, so you have to con consider that first. Also, Cisco is not that crusty. They rename things all the time. <laughs> nice. Oh. Oh, was there somebody else? Let's go up in, a, in the uh, stairs here. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, I, I was just going to say, uh, my answer to the internal external is whether <laughs> is actually understanding the problem because a lot of times what I found is going outside means that you're not understanding the problem and you're going out to over engineer it. Mm -hmm. Or you're like, hey, that's really cool. I want that extra speed. I want the buzzword. I need microservices for this when you're not building that. Yeah. You know. So it's a matter of correctly understanding your problem yep. and getting your team to look at what the right solution is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, understanding why, and it's it's going back to that, you know, simple, right? Making sure it's simple. If it's simple enough for everyone to understand, you won't have a problem, right? Yeah. When it gets so complicated that now, you know, one person understands it, you know, now you have a problem. So I think, you know, yeah, keep it simple. Right. Hey, Adam, um, very good analogy. Thank you. Powerful and apt. <clears throat> that makes me very curious uh, to know when you start engaging with, you know, a customer, right? Um, how do you go about the first three days uh, in terms of maybe objective by the end of day one, day two, day three, uh, not necessarily in technical, but just in the general approach. Yeah, how we, uh, man, you know, just sitting down and talking to people is generally the way we start. So, you know, start interviewing people and understand what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they work. Um, and then, you know, from there, I think, you know, um, Depends on the goal of the project, but you know, looking at org charts and understanding the team dynamics is always interesting. Um, understanding who has you know way too much on their plate or who's you know the super stressed people in the group, I think, you know, kind of points out some some failures. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyone else think about what you do? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we we really just so we take the approach of just getting to know you, mm -hmm. right? Um, Asya pointed it out uh, very clearly, right? We, we start by asking a whole lot of boring and annoying questions, right? Um, and uh, you know, some of them seem that way, but you'd be surprised. And so the, the other thing that, that we do is we really engage in conversation. And Adam said it, it's not about us, it's about them. It's about, uh, the, it's about the collective, right? And so um, what we're trying to understand is your organization and what needs to change in order for your organization to meet its mission. And ultimately, for ho hopefully, everyone to be satisfied with that, right? The satisfaction is the hardest thing to get to, and usually culture is a barrier. So uh, we, we sort of pay attention to everything from infrastructure to culture to all of that stuff, because if, if your organization isn't doing that, um, you're missing the problem entirely, right? Mm -hmm. Culture is just key to getting anything done. I think I've said this a few times, but you could put the perfect IT thing in front of everybody, and if the culture's not ready to accept it, the whole problem, but it's like it's going to fail, right? So I think we have time for one more over here. No. Oh, no. Okay. Staff. So with that, thank you. Thank you. Do you still have the lab on? Oh. Hmm? <laughs> and in terms of structure, this is going to be the final talk with slides. And then we'll probably have a conversation like we just did that extends for as long as it needs to, or 3.55, at which point I'll ask for the wrap-up. And we are happy to hang out and talk as long as you want to afterwards, <coughs> but that, that will be the, uh, the 4 o'clock is the end point. So last formal talk. All right. I have no idea how I drew the short straw uh, to follow all this up and to be at the end and to uh, you know, bore you to completion. But um, so... Uh, I decided to pick something to wake everyone up and something that's absolutely certain to have pissed somebody in this room off um, at all times, and that's security, right? So um, depending on which side of this you're on, uh, well, we'll see if this is interesting or, or whatever. So, um, you know, the real problem I think that we run into all the time is that, um, you know, we really need to do IT at the speed of science, right? And we don't. We do IT at the speed of, like, business administration, which is just glacial, right? Um, on purpose, it's glacial, right? Um, web and email is not how we get science done, right? Floating Word documents around is, is you know, not how we collaborate, right? 
um, you know, and, and being super, super safe and secure um, is awesome, except that it's a myth, right? So um, we spend a whole bunch of effort and people stake their careers and are incentivized the wrong way uh, to try to protect us from incursion. Um, and, you know, we end up in the process just killing the innovation machines that our companies are trying to move forward, right? And so basically what we need to do is step up IT sort of into a holistic model to support data movement, all right? Um, and so, you know, the, the issue, a lot of places that we walk into, most IT services are completely separated, right? We talk about silos all the time, you know, silos of excellence, silos of failure, whatever you want to look at it as, right? Um, and that's the problem, right? Network is not different than storage, is not different than compute, is not different than security, is not different than applications or policy, right? Those have to work in, in a continuum. That's why, uh, I don't know who, who's seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs from, uh, from uh, psychology, but we sort of redid this for IT. Right? Um, in that, you know, the fundamental thing that everybody needs for, uh, for uh, scientific computing to work well is the network. Right? If that doesn't work, everything else fails. Right? And then somewhere in between there, you've got infrastructure, uh, you know, storage and compute and data management uh, sitting on top of that. And unless those three layers are correct, you can't effectively do tools and workflows. If you can't do any of that stuff and have the people up the side to support the whole thing, that pinnacle, the top, the shining uh, you know, hope at the end is discovery, right? And that's what we're all trying to do here, right? We're trying to improve human knowledge and improve discovery. And so without all these things uh, working sort of in unison, you're never ever gonna get there. You can't think of them in isolation, right? So basically, I spend most of my time these days, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to crash bioteam into the ground, and then also, also working on networking as the main uh, problem of things, right? So uh, basically, science, first and foremost right now, it's a networking problem. Uh, without high-performance networking, petascale is just useless. You have to move data. I don't care who you are or how you think you're going to move your, your analysis to the data, you're gonna have to move the data at some point. And if you're anywhere above a couple of petabytes, your network has to be really solid to make that work, and any time that's not gonna you know, crash your productivity, right? Um, most orgs that we work with are well into the tens of petabytes. Uh, most laboratories right now, and this is from uh, Chris Dagg, uh, is need to be peta capable, right? If, if one of your labs has a light sheet microscope or a cryo EM or a couple of sequencers, there's a possibility that laboratory is going to generate a petabyte of data this year, right? Um, that's a new reality that's way off the map. That means that your laboratories now have to be well, well uh, integrated into your, uh, your workflow and your IT infrastructure, right? 10 gig to the lab is pretty rare. How many people have 10 gig to the lab? I know there's a few. We're getting there, right? But that's, that's kind of be, gonna become a minimum uh, pretty soon here, right? The biggest issue is that traditional enterprise networks were really developed, developed for web and email and business administration, right? Um, uh, thousands of really tiny workflows in the kilobytes to megabytes um, that, that just bounce all over the place, right? And um, the, the, the complete antithesis to that is scientific data movement, right? Uh, and Asya touched on this, right? Uh, which is really a few very large flows in the gigabytes to terabytes range, right? Um, and so those two things are completely at odds with each other. And so when you're trying to move large data and your network is developed for uh, the lots of small little bits um, uh, and also treated as a cost center uh, to be controlled, yeah, you, the moving single streams of large data just really doesn't work, right? Um, and then also the security tends to squash it down, right? Um, uh, because people put security in line because, you know, building walls keeps things safe, as we all know, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, the network becomes key. Um, and so the result is that this becomes the most common high-speed network, right? Uh, you know, FedEx is uh, really high bandwidth and really high latency, right? Um, and so they also have a reasonable drop, drop frame rate where they drop your hard drive, so pack them well. Um, so, you know, and, you know, literally I have had FedEx run over my hard drives before. So uh, not, not to mention that uh, doing data ingest from a bunch of hard drives that people uh, copied onto from some USB connection somewhere and, it, you know, moving that onto your GPFS system, Super annoying. Ask Amazon, they're going through this right now, right? So, um, and then there's enterprise security. Um, uh, those of us who do enterprise security uh, hate enterprise security. Those of us who are the victim of enterprise security hate enterprise security, right? It's just sort of universally hated, right? And, it's, and the problem in enterprise security is that it's sort of universally applied to all use cases, right? The security uh, environment is designed for the highest risk data, data in the network, right? 
that is just a complete failure in policy, in my opinion, right? Because usually the highest risk data in, in the environment is 1% of your data, right? So now you've taken a giant sledgehammer to your whole organization, driven productivity and innovation into the ground because you want to protect this little box over here, right? Um, it's, a, it's really the opposite of, of where things need to be, right? And so, uh, you know, and science today just simply cannot be done without collaboration and data sharing, right? If your security is so tight that you have to go through three, three weeks of background checks, fingerprinting, and, you know, go take, you know, uh, 15 hours of training before you can, you know, have a collaborator come in and work with you, things are wrong. You're not doing science. Uh, you're doing, I don't know, dictatorship. I don't know what that is. Um, so the, 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 the thing is that security is very, very necessary, right? It's a real thing, right? But it can be applied pretty flexibly. So the bottom line is that uh, I feel like it's time for security to evolve. We've moved beyond the sledgehammer, and honestly, so have the hackers, right? This is something that we really need to think about. I think this picture kind of exemplifies this, right? The security dude uh, sitting asleep behind the cardboard cutout of the scary guy, right? Um, that's, that's kind of the way we've evolved to this, because we sort of throw firewalls in front of things and go, oh, we're safe, right? And no, you're not, right? Um, and so. You know, the, the interesting thing is that we have the technology and the ability. <laughs> <laughs> now it's really secure. And the security has shut me down. <laughs> that was a clever hack, I have to say. Good job, whoever that was. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, I did the dunk. <laughs> Just unplug it. It's IT. secure. Sorry. <laughs> Does anybody here who knows IT? <laughs> Where is the slide? Yeah, really, right? Um. <laughs> it just shows you how passionate he is about well, the topic. That's yeah, exciting. Your laptop. We had it before. Remember? Yeah, I don't know where it went. It's weird. Oh, here, hold on. I don't know why this opened. Technical problems. Google um, Slides. Google Slides. <laughs> this is our first time trying this, so you guys have been a an experiment, and this is not going. Reload, yeah, it might be the network. Did the network go away? Did the network just go down? Here, Sweet, we don't really have a backup. Hold Here, hold on. <laughs> um, so can we? Yeah, Yay. <laughs> All right. Multiple copies. All right, so uh, I'm gonna move from my phone for a minute while um, uh, Reverend Adam is cleaning up after me. Um, so. It's basically time for uh, security to evolve, right? Um, use security methodologies that are appropriate to the measures you're trying to control, right? To make it appropriate to the workflows you're trying to do, right? Um, we do have that technology to separate the traffic based on what it is, right? We have um, a lot of intelligence in, in the environment right now um, that allows us to make those sort of decisions, right? A mouse genome does not, does not carry a, a, a computer virus, all right? And it's huge, right? Uh, you don't need to inspect every packet for, uh, for, for a computer virus in a mouse genome, right? You're wasting a lot of time and a lot of effort by doing that, right? If someone, and the, the truth is, is that if someone really wants your stuff, I sort of said it earlier, um, uh, you know, they're going to get it, right? They're going to get past the firewall, right? Um, and so, um, you know, you need, you need sort of a last line of defense against your data, right? Are we getting there? Oh, sweet. Maybe we can just mirror. Uh, okay, I don't need my notes. Oh, and that's over there. Awesome. Trying. Good. There we go. There you go. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> All right. Can you advance? Yeah, I sit down a lot. All right, All right we're good. <laughs> now we're going to review everything, okay? <laughs> Remember this? The, All right. Yeah, yeah, this is like last year. <laughs> yeah. This is Chris's regular pace. Yeah. All right. There we go. All right, so this, this is what I was just talking about. So. Um, 
you know, basically what we've done is evolved how we approach networking in science, right? Uh, we, can, we have the Department of Energy to thank for this, the concept of a science DMZ, right? And this is kind of what a science DMZ looks like. Those of you who uh, came to my talk yesterday, I talked about this rather extensively. But the bottom line is that the enterprise simply isn't agile enough or capable enough of handling your science data, and so create a new network. Okay, um, and so if you move the whole science uh, uh, enclave outside of your network, so that, that cloud there to the right there uh, would be sort of your site or campus or, or, or location or whatever, the enterprise, outside of that into what's, typical, what's called in networking parlance the demilitarized zone, which is a little bit unfortunate, but that's, that's essentially what it is, um, and it's outside the company firewalls. Okay, what that allows you to do is to redefine the security model that you're operating in your science environment, right? Um, and it also allows you to architect this type of networking in a very fast and very clean fashion, right? The point of this is to move data fast and cleanly and to uh, reduce the barriers uh, to, to science getting done well, right? So this is obviously the most simplistic model of this possible, right? Um, the problem is, is that, well, and so one thing you'll notice here is that there's no red firewall between the outside world, the wide area network, and this, net and this environment, right? Uh, there's good reasons for that, which I'm going to come back to, right? Um, the thing is, is that firewalls, this is my birds and the bees talk about firewalls, they don't work like you think they do, right? They're not these magical boxes that just sort of make you secure, um, uh, first of all. Uh, if you use them right, uh, maybe they are. Um, and they have a lot of really, really cool features, and they're awesome for the enterprise. But the problem is, is that most firewalls are composed of a set of, 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 of processors that are uh, lined up in parallel that inspect and analyze your data through ASICs, right? Um, automatically programmed things that respond to policies that you program into them. And so that's what they look like if you break them out on the right. You might have a 10 gig firewall, and it can say 10 gig on both ends, but inside it's actually a bunch of digital, digital signal processors that can only function at one gig at a time, right? And each one of those locks to a TCP stream. So if you're sending multiple terabytes of data through something, and you've got a 10 gig network, and it's going through a firewall, you're probably only gonna get one gig out of it, right? And so this is something that most people don't understand about firewalls. A couple of new firewalls really actually do this at speed, up to 100 gig, but you're really gonna pay for them, right? Um, and so you know, this is an excellent fit for the enterprise traffic pro profile if you think about it, right? This is architected specifically to handle the many small flows problem, web and email documents, you know, uh, quick requests to things, right? That fits this model really well because that parallelizes in batch, right? It's an embarrassingly parallel problem, right? Uh, uh, high performance data transfer is not an embarrassingly parallel problem um, because you can't split it up like that, right? So it's time for an alternative network security model, right, which the science DMZs have been implementing for a while now, right? Um, again, clean network paths are the way to go. If you look at this diagram and you think about uh, uh, what a firewall is, uh, NIST, uh, the National Institutes for Standards and Technology, sees two firewalls, right? Um, there's the actual firewall with uh, the word firewall slick string on the side up there in the right-hand corner, and then there's the thing at the middle with, which is a switch or a router, which really does uh, um, uh, uh, access control lists and port filters super effectively at full speed without dropping packets, right? And if you know anything about TCP IP, which we all use every day, drop packets are the death of your, of your wide area network, right? It drops off so fast that uh, it doesn't matter what you do. So really what you want is a, is a relatively lossless environment. And so every time you put a firewall in the way, every time a processor gets busy in the firewall, it's gonna start dropping packets because it's in line, right? And that's gonna slow everything down. So, um, I think I talked through about all of this. So um, basically, uh, when you use uh, the, the newest network hardware um, as sort of a stateless firewall, um, because you know, the reality is, is that you know, what do you get for, uh, for having a stateful connection? You get you know, uh, application analysis, right? That's what everyone's really looking for. You know? uh, let me inspect my word files for viruses. Let me look for um, you know, malware uh, hiding in, in email streams. The thing is, is that none of those are programmed for BAM files. Right? Uh, none of those are programmed even for, uh, for large image uh, file types, right? Um, and so the, the processors just sit there and turn on it and don't ever get anything from it. So why not exempt it, right? Um, and so the, the interesting thing about a science DMZ is that you can basically, you can restrict, uh, it, it, so the difference between a science DMZ and an enterprise, uh, aside from the performance uh, matrix, is that you have a much, much smaller set of use cases that you're accessing there, right? 
scientific analysis, scientific data movement, scientific storage. That's what you're looking at, right? Uh, you, you're not having people browse the web. You don't have you know, desktops sitting in there. People aren't going to YouTube. People aren't looking at cat pictures, right? Um, they're, they're using it for science, which means that essentially at the border, you can restrict the hell out of that thing, right? You can put access control lists that only allow access to externally facing surfaces coming in, and you can limit your, your TCP ports to something that, that is, you know, you need to let Globus through, right? You need to let SSH through, right? But other than that, you don't. So what that does is shrink the universe of, of what people can attack you out down to this, right? And really reduces what a firewall really needs to do and makes it much more defensible, right? So the other thing that you do here is that if you look at sort of a, a more blown out view of what a science DMZ is, um, the other uh, best practice from science DMZs is to use an out of band intrusion detection system, right? The one that's uh, most commonly used in this environment is from Bro, right? Hey, Bro. Um, and it's, you know, it's the Bro uh, performance monitor, or, or sorry, network monitor system, right? And basically the way we've done this um, is, is essentially, you know, you basically got a, an optical path between you and your ISP. Uh, you stick a prism in the middle. Um, you run the light two directions. One goes into your border router and one goes into this intrusion detection system. What that means is that each photon is reaching the point at the exact same time. The reason why security people put things in line is because uh, you want to catch the thing happening first, right? But what that does is slow everything down and put a big border up, right? When you send the packets to the same thing and you start analyzing it with a really, really high performance analyzer, at the same time, you're not hampering the data, you're letting it go, but because most of your workflows are large workflows, if something is weird, that thing can shut it down before it causes any damage. So it's really proactive. Um, um, uh, data analysis versus sort of the reactive and you know close everything down because I feel safer and I'm going to hold my gun at the door type of thing, right? So um, that's that's how that works. Um, and then you know when you go even deeper into an alternative security model, right? Um, there's these wonderful things that we've been able to do for about oh 40 years called network segments, right? Uh, where you can actually create segments of your network, different IP ranges, different VLANs, different things like that, and you can really control at the switch and the router level what can talk to what and what can't, right? And so you can really just, through simple, simple VLAN authorizations and uh, really tight uh, access control list between them, really hide something so that nothing can get to it, right? Um, and if we move a little bit forward here, um, multi-factor authentication is a thing that we should be doing, right? Um, it's uh, just, just plain and simple. So, um, you know, NIST uh, just released a statement basically saying that passwords are a thing of the past, all right? Uh, all the hackers know all the tricks, no password of any complexity, or even if you change it every day, is going to keep you safe, okay? So multi-factor authentication is the only way uh, to, to fix that, right? Because your, your password or your authentication uh, major, uh, uh, um, uh, key only lasts one time, right? And you're the only one who knows that. So um, that's, that's a really good way to keep uh, a relatively open environment safe. Um, and you never have to change your password again. So that's an interesting thing, right? Um, the other thing is deep integration of identity and access management, right? Um, we talked a lot about it uh, throughout the panel this time, but if you really treat um, access, if you treat security at the point of data that matters, right? Now you can open up your environment a lot. That 1% of data that needs tight security, limit access to that through multi-factor authentication and a security group in Active Directory uh, to a very few, pe a little, few uh, bits of people that can access that. And then um, don't have your, pa your, your, your system operating that with a root password, right? Um, Amazon does this all the time. You can't use a root password there. There's a good reason. It's certificate-based access only, which means that a hacker really can't get in, right, uh, to, to, to get at that data, right? So you've really secured yourself in a lot of interesting ways. A uh, quick new innovation here um, that came to us from one of our customers um, is this thing that sort of lets, your, it lets you have your cake and eat it too in these uh, science environments, right? Um, the, uh, this, this is something called Direct Flow Assist, which um, uh, was pioneered by Arista um, and, uh, and partnered by Palo Alto and is going to be extended to other firewall things. Uh, the bottom line here, uh, since I went over with you know, uh, kicking the HDMI cable, is that this is really close to content-aware filtering, right? Um, which is really where we need to go. It seems like we could do a match on this type of data needs to do this and has this transfer profile. Um, are we sure we trust the source? Yes, okay, let it through. Don't put it through the firewall. That's exactly what this does, right? Um, and it does it through a security policy on the firewall. And everything else um, that, that aren't those trusted policies that we, that, we, that we know what to do with, they go through the firewall, 
right? And the firewall basically is a firewall on a stick, looks like a lollipop hanging off the thing so that either it's in line or it's not. It adds a lot of flexibility to the environment. So what is this, I think I have like two slides left. So what does the distributed security model really do? Um, and so this is a distributed security model, in case I didn't say that. Um, instead of having one thing doing your security, you got a few things doing your security. It's harder to manage, right, but it allows for performance and clean paths with your security. Um, if you keep the data path simple, um, that's a, a, a theme that we've been repeating all day here, keep it simple, um, then it's, it's a lot harder uh, to hack it. When you have a lot of complexity at your border, there are a lot more weak points uh, to go through. Um, the other thing is that using something like Bro allows you to effectively monitor 100 gig connections. There aren't any uh, analysis systems today that really do that well, right? Uh, Bro operates in a clustered mode. It's basically an HPC system that in parallel analyzes those data paths. So you can make a cluster of arbitrary size to handle a, a whole lot of data at once, which is actually going to be, uh, uh, be able to analyze things in real time uh, at those speeds. Again, treat data, you're allowed to, uh, it allows you to treat data with the proper levels of security. Uh, you can keep the high-risk data, uh, data locked down with access control and MFA, um, but don't run the elephant uh, flows through the security equipment that can't handle it uh, because you know, that's the use case and that's what needs to happen. So in the end, we all need to stop making excuses, right? This is actually a really exciting time to be in information security, right? Um, the realities of compromise are higher than ever, but we need security, right? Um, this is a very, very real issue. Um, anyone who's seen uh, control logs at the border of any institution knows that hacking attempts happen you know, several thousand times per second for most organizations. This is not something that you can ignore. But the thing is, we all have to stop thinking about it like we did 15 years ago, right? Things have evolved. Right? Small things like you know, separating the control plane and the data plane, where all your data is going, of your border networking equipment so that they don't talk to each other. All modern equipment does this. Right? If you're lazy and want to SSH to your box from outside, you've opened your control plane to the data plane, and yes, that's a security flaw. If you don't, and you put it out of band and access it through a cell network or something, uh, you don't have to worry about that. So now what you can do is have your internet connection coming into the same thing that your data center is coming into, and you've saved yourself money, you've simplified your network, and you're secure, right? <coughs> to keep ahead, we have to learn to innovate, right? The hackers are, right? They're innovating every day. They want your stuff, right? So if we're thinking 15 years ago, um, we're not going to keep up. And you have to be, be, be uh, vigilant, not fearful, right? Fear is going to kill innovation. Let's learn something, let's try something, create a sandbox, put, uh, you know, try this in an environment where uh, damage isn't going to go forward. Um, if we do uh, all this stuff right, uh, science wins. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question. What's the single most important thing that an organization could do to improve their security posture right now? Limit uh, uh, the, the access um, uh, depth, right? So um, I think the, the simplest thing to do that's easiest to do is lock down your border, right? Not with a firewall, but by access control, mm. right? You know, close down to what you really need. You can let all your inside out, because hopefully you trust that, right? Um, but, and if you don't, you've got other problems. Um, but uh, for the stuff that needs to come in, ask, you know, open it only to those things, right? And understand your, your, your port situation, right? And only open those. That makes it way more defensible. The second thing is enact good identity and access management, because on the back end, that's going to be your last line of defense. That's how I would answer that. Opening it up, questions on anything for any of the panelists, including from the panel? Question. Yeah. I I'd like to ask the audience along the security line, like, how many of you all feel that you have a very good understanding um, of the network traffic going in and out of your border? Like, and for how many do they feel it's a black box? So how many feel like you have a really good understanding, you know what's going in and out of there? I see one person in the back. Yeah. <laughs> how many people have any idea what we're share. talking about? And how many people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how many people feel like they don't know then? Everyone else, okay. Yeah. The InfoSec people don't like to share. I think that's the. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, the other interesting thing I think is that, um, you know, security people tend to be incentivized incorrectly, right? Um, you know, the incentive is if a hack happens or we get compromised and we lose data, your head rolls. That's the incentive, right? Um, you know, living in a fear based uh, society makes it really hard to innovate, right? Um, uh, so, uh, what we have to do is say, okay, since, since uh, you know, incursions are going to happen, right, because they will happen, 
Uh, who has been hack-free forever in your organization? <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, you don't count. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it's going to happen. So incentivizing them to make it not happen isn't going to get it there. How about we incentivize more of how many days have we gone without an event, right? Um, and uh, when that happens, now we're innovating. Yeah, that reminds me of the old joke about uh, when you see 0% failure, that just means your monitoring is broken. <laughs> You know, and, and back to Adam's point, the question, uh, if, if we're truly fearless about failure, you should expect to see failure. Yes. If you are not seeing uh, sprints get blown up because the team changed what they needed to do in the middle, if you're not noticing the attacks from time to time, it's that's because right. you're not looking. And that's a general cultural issue, yeah. right? Um, is that, you know, don't, don't uh, you know, as, as management, you know, don't be afraid of failure. That's an opportunity to learn, right? Uh, uh, you know, analyze, analyze your people in your workforce based on how they recover from those experiences. One more millennial thing, post-mortems. Super yeah, post -mortems important. Are great. They love doing post-mortems. They're really painful and uncomfortable, but they help. Mm -hmm. yep. So I guess this question is open to any and all. Um, you know, really great rumination on uh, sort of experiences and, and uh, insights from the last uh, few years. But what about forward-looking? Three to five years from now, it's okay, just talk. <laughs> Put it right in front of my face, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we can hear you okay. It, it it looks yeah, that's here. what I thought. So just curious, um, in the next three to five years, what are the most, uh, the technologies um, to most likely become disruptive? Right, they may not be there yet, but there are things to keep an eye out for. I'll let Aaron start. <laughs> if I didn't drop enough hits and hints in my talk, I think I did something wrong. Um, I'm actually going to creatively allow others to answer because I have too many opinions here. But I just wanted to inject one thing about security is just be proactive and not reactive. I want to like triple underscore what Ari said. That was the question behind my question was if you're reactive, it means you don't check. If you're proactive, it means you get in the junk and see what's going on. Yep. But uh, I will let others answer that question. And I'm going to totally hijack that question because it's the one I wanted to end on, which is <laughs> to the entire panel, briefly, succinctly, 144 characters. What do you walk out of here thinking about for the future? What's the, what's the thing we see at the conference, and what are we talking about and thinking about in this industry for the next year? You, you want to start at the end? All right. Yeah. So um, I, I, I actually wrote this down during the thing. So I think um, if I had to name and shame particular technologies, um, it's uh, serverless and microservices and function, functions as a service that will be sort of transformative over the next couple of years. Um, serverless will be the low-hanging fruit. The problem with microservices is you need to actually program and have APIs. And you know, if you have a collection of crew who are shell scripters and, group, and sort of glue people, uh, you, know, you need real software engineers to do real microservices. So there's, a, there's an architectural and sort of team building leap there. But um, for me, uh, function as a service and serverless stuff is the transformative stuff. And in terms of what I would want people to leave the room with, um, you know, I've been doing this type of work for close to 20 years now, and it's it's an it's a never-ending exchange of what problem are we fighting today. Um, in the early days, it was compute and HPC. Then it became a couple of years where petascale storage was really scary and risky, and then that got easy. You know, now the current challenge is network um, at the perimeter and outside of the boundary. But um, my the thing that uh, particularly at this particular conference and going to the talks and seeing the trade show is um. I think my last parting words are breathing room because it actually feels like in 2017, IT is, is solving IT challenges slightly faster than those silly scientists are creating them for us. It, it feels like we really have you know, hit that curve where the challenges are being addressed a little bit faster than the scientists are creating new ones, and that makes me feel very hopeful uh, about the future. I think that the, the word is breathing room. It feels like we're slowly getting to a point where we might have some breathing room on the whole IT science divide over the next couple of years. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that dovetails in perfectly because um, we need breathing room because, um, you know, we're, we are going through, um, you know, a really transformative time where a lot of paradigms are shifting. Um, over the last decade, we got very comfortable with a lot of the way server designs were thrown out. We've largely taken PC computers and thrown them in racks and thrown PC operating systems on them and then abstracted and, and moved forward and forward. But all of that is absolutely not going to work in a multi-cloud uh, microservice environment. So um, 
I used to really say, you know, it's just time for the Web 2.0 and HPC to get married and have a scientific platform child. Um, <laughs> and so really this became real for me attending some enterprise conferences this year and seeing actually in some ways enterprise is ahead of science now because they realize how old and busted they are. So there's kind of a duality there of people that are doing the established enterprise IT and people that are trying to move forward um, to the kind of concept of the third platform and what's next. And they see that chasm and they're actively trying to build solutions to cross it. I feel like what happened was, uh, you know, scientific computing and research support in IT really kind of forked off of enterprise. Um, and, you know, we kind of did our own thing and, and made some gains and made things better for ourselves. But I feel we've actually, we're actually kind of blind to the whole movement and need for the third platform and don't, either don't think it applies to us or just aren't ready for it. I don't think we're seeing that chasm. Um, so I really think over the next couple of years, what I'm hoping will happen is the lights are gonna go on and, and we're gonna realize that chasm is there and we won't make the mistake of just jumping onto what the enterprise has done to catch up, that instead we will still continue to pave a path for a scientific platform globally that fosters science um, and that we will actually then take up that challenge and transform. Um, and for any specific, uh, less hand wavy things, just see my slides. <laughs> Oh, actually, before we move on to the next one, I'm supposed to tell you, I've been, people have been tweeting at me, um, all of the slides will be given out at the end. CHI has your email addresses, so um, we'll, we'll give away all the materials as well at the end of this. I'm going to do this in eight bits, hmm? or eight words. <laughs> so since this is all about data, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about networking, storage, or workflows, um, what I always do, I uh, collect, index, analyze, visualize, find patterns, automate, and repeat. Just do it with everything. It works every single time. That's going to be shared too, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, uh, thinking ahead, you know, um, you know, biology has obviously now become a tech discipline. And I think in three to five years, the technological change, I'm, I'm not really that interested in. Um, I think it's about the people. And I think, you know, at BioTeam, our mission statement is enabling science. And I'm starting to figure out that enabling science is just enabling people. Um, so my takeaway is uh, to own the mission, and uh, if it's not your mission, you won't overcome the resistance, right? And embrace the grind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, and so my answer to this is uh, follows on uh, Adam's really closely, and that is that um, I think in the next three to five years, we're going to see more and more things abstracted away from, uh, from the actual infrastructure problems, right? Um, it's not going to matter where your disks are. It's not going to matter what your compute is. It's not going to matter which cloud you're using. Um, there's going to be some middleware that makes your life a lot easier and reduces the universe of what you have to pay attention to to something that you can really take a look at and really understand. Um, and follow on to that, um, I think why that has to happen and how, why it has to happen in a specific pattern is that uh, scientific computing now must to reach the long tail of science, right? Um, it's been sort of limited to sort of the, the, the high part of the tail uh, for a long time to uh, specific individuals who were uh, innovative and pioneering and to people who had the sophistication to get there. The reality is, is that lab scientists who have never touched a command line know what a command line is or think a command line is a bad word um, are, aren't going to be able to use it and they're not interested in using it. They're interested in using a workflow that's going to get them their answer, doing it through a web browser or from their iPhone and, and getting that done and that's not an easy problem to solve but that's, uh, that's where we're going to go I think. Swan count. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to get more of the population in. I completely agree with Ari that man <laughs> managing identity and authentication in a way that we can have citizen scientists and research participants and researchers and technologists all inter interchangeably contributing without having to have, you know, a dozen passwords and a dozen RSA fobs and all of that, if we can enable the community to work better together. <laughs> and like you said, the technology for this exists. Like, I, I, I have a Fitbit. I can share that data with my family. You know, the technology is there, we just need to adopt it. And if we can get more people in, these problems get, uh, get easier. That's my thought.